Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, this is uh, Friday, July 9th, and this is, I will call, now call to order the meeting of the Audit and Risk Management Committee. Um, let me have Trevor please call the roll. Ms. Higa? Ms. Yamamoto? Here. For the Director of Finance, Ms. Whitaker? Here. For the State Treasurer, Mr. Rufino? Present. For the Superintendent of Public Instruction, Mr. Johnson? Here. Controller Yee, you have a quorum present. Thank you so much, Trevor. Uh, thank you. Um, let me just note that there will be a public comment period at the end of each agenda item and uh, the time allotment and other items are and other terms are subject to change and are at the discretion of the committee chair. Uh, so let's take up our first order of business and that is approval of the committee agenda. Um, is there a motion? So moved. Okay. Motion I'll by Mr. Rafino. I'll second. Okay. Seconded by Ms. Whitaker. Um, yes. Julie, I have a question. Are we going to, um, on the, we're, it's about item number three to be yes. pulled off. Of, okay. Is that the appropriate time to do that or? Uh, sure. We can do it now or at the, at, at the time that the item comes up, but, uh, okay. I'm happy to, I'm happy to revise that now. Um, uh, there is a, um, a recommendation to pull item number three off of consent, the informational item. So there can be a discussion on uh, um, some of the sub items uh, in, that, uh, in that agenda um, item. So uh, why don't we do that now as part of the approval of the minutes? Okay, so, the um, uh, or excuse me, approval of the agenda. So Mr. Rufino, approval of the agenda is amended. Yes. Second by Ms. Whitaker. Okay, um, <clears throat> without objection. Okay, such will be the order. All right, our next item is uh, the consent agenda action item. Uh, this is approval of the minutes of March 5th. And um, I do believe we have a couple of revisions on that, just minor revisions um, that were submitted to uh, the staff. Um, just noting uh, that uh, the um, meeting was uh, called to order by uh, Lynn Paquin as well as adjourned by Lynn Paquin. And those are noted on uh, page two and page four respectively. Okay. And those, edit, those edits have been made. Okay, great. Thank you, Brian. So um, without objection, then, the minutes are approved for March 5th, 2021. Thank you. All right. Um, then uh, we are now on to item number three. Uh, this is a progress report on the 2020 independent auditor's report on internal control over financial reporting and the management letter. And uh, we did pull this item and I know one of the issues that we do wanna have um, addressed is um, how the finding uh, relative to the uh, reporting of fair value and the hierarchy of the private equity and co-investments have been addressed. There's been some progress made there and we felt it was important to at least uh, have a public discussion about that. So uh, let me go ahead and uh, turn it over. Maybe, um, uh, Julie, you wanna take this? Be, be happy to. Thank you. Julie Underwood, Chief Financial Officer. So since the last report that you received on this uh, significant deficiency, um, we've had several things um, progress on that. So one is we've implemented a new assessment tool for the preparation of the June 2021 financial statements. Now that tool assists staff in evaluating the fair value and hierarchy categorization for new private assets. And that'll provide us with more precision to the reporting process. We've also selected or in, are, and are in the final stages of completing the contract for a third party vendor with investment reporting expertise. Um, and this vendor will help us to evaluate our current processes and provide any recommendations for improvements. Now we do expect this review to be completed by this December. Now, in addition, an independent valuation firm has completed its valuation review of the private assets identified in the audit and they found no significant deviations from our initial reporting for June 2022. So that was good. Um, and these valuations will continue on a semi-annual basis. So we do continue to make progress. And I did want to take this opportunity to thank my staff, as well as Chris's staff for working together to address this issue. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Oh, 
Oh, I think you're on mute, Controller Yee. Thank you, of course. Um, thank you, Julie, and really appreciate the uh, effort of staff to address this finding um, and really getting out ahead of it uh, as we uh, increase our uh, activity in the private asset um, uh, space. So thank you. Uh, let me turn to uh, Mr. Getman, uh, comments on this one. I do, and let me lower that hand. There we go. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So um, I am just really, really pleased uh, with respect to how this, this item was treated. Um, it was a significant deficiency, which uh, is, an important, is an important finding, and, and it was uh, an important finding. And I'm just really pleased with two things. First is the way with which the accounting function uh, grabbed hold of it under the leadership of Ms. Underwood and said, you know, it's, it's important to get the right numbers into the set of financial statements, even if it's something small. And this was really small, right? Let's all remember that this is an immaterial amount with respect to the financial statements as a whole, okay? Nonetheless, um, what, an, what an opportune time and place to put in place a system of controls to catch something that might come along in the future that might be larger. So this was just a really great time uh, for something very small like this to crop up and um, for us to say as an organization, for CalSERS to say as an organization, hey, what can we put in place to deal with, with something? And so I'm just really pleased with the way accounting has handled it. Second, um, I, I think we need to recognize uh, how well the investments branch handled it under the leadership of Mr. John. And of course, it all rolls up to Mr. Ailman, of course, but um, they just really, rather than trying to say, oh, it's small, don't worry about it, brush it off. That was not the case at all. In fact, it's exactly the opposite happened, which is they embraced it as an opportunity to uh, put in place additional controls, some of which are independent observations that will happen twice a year as mentioned by Ms. Underwood. And th these, these mechanisms were not only embraced, but I believe that they were wisely chosen and, and I suspect that they'll be highly effective. And so I see this as just a win-win-win for, for the organization. It, it uncovered something, it sort of nipped it in the bud, is I guess how I would word it. And it gave the organization an, an opportunity to improve on so many dimensions. This is particularly important because private equity will possibly become uh, a more significant part of the portfolio. Maybe not, but it, but it might. But, and if it does, then this is just an ideal situation in which to put those controls in place. So um, as a consultant whose responsibility is to help the board oversee these functions, um, I'm just really pleased by uh, the way in which accounting and investments has, has handled it. And that's all I've got, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Getman. Um, Chris, I see you on. Um, thank you for uh, your uh, early attention to this as well, you and your team. So just really pleased with the uh, address of this finding um, and uh, really setting the uh, path for um, just um, not uh, running into um, problems later on down the road. So appreciate that. Um, any other comments from uh, committee members on this item? Uh, Karen, Ms. Yamamoto. Hi, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my, my questions are about the attachment one, um, the blue section, I guess, the next page, page three. Uh-huh. And um, we, I'm looking at the middle column, the second, the second um, paragraph, and you talk about the training services. So besides the training, what is the progress on guidelines for employers specifically with regard to the DB and DBS reporting? And so I, it wasn't clear to me um, how that's going to look. And then um, on this, on the third column, you know, what do the job aids include? Are they uh, computer-based training only? Are they documents, things like that? Is that is that an appropriate question to ask at this time? Sure, absolutely. Let me, um, I, I'm gonna just uh, hang on one second and see if uh, Ms. Whitaker's question relates to uh, the first um, issue that we spoke about. Okay, and then Karen, we'll get to your question on okay, the sure. uh, member data. Okay, uh, Ms. Whitaker, yeah, Jennifer. 
Thank you. Um, just a quick question on the, um, this is for Julie, the third party vendor that's going to be hired for expertise. Um, in the actual finding, it says that this engagement effort will be completed by December 2021. Does that mean that this, um, this third party is only for this period or will they continue on to assist in this effort to ensure that there's um, a, someone else looking at it to ensure that we're within the, the number? For this scope of work, it's just a one-time review only of our internal controls. Okay. Um, so we weren't planning on doing it on a regular basis, um, but we could certainly reevaluate it after the initial review is completed to see if that would be something that would be necessary on an ongoing basis. So does that mean that the tool that's being put in place and the other controls in place will not necessitate the third-party vendor in future years? That's what we're, we're hoping, okay. and we just wanted them to come in and just take a fresh eyes approach and look at it and just to make sure we weren't missing anything, but the tool will continue. Okay. Cause that's a staff tool. Okay. Thank you. Hey, I'm sorry. I'd, I'd, I'm, if I could, I'd just like to point out that um, on, on the attachment there in the third column in the second paragraph, the, the last sentence there it says that those co-investment valuations and those reviews will continue to be performed on a sen semi-annual basis. And so it is something that the investment office intends to uh, continue with and, and to always have that um, over additional oversight. I think it's important because there was a lot of discussion yesterday about these co-investments. And so it, it is another set of eyes that they do intend um, on having uh, review those valuations. Yeah, no, thank you, Larry, uh, for that. So uh, I think that's a great address of the finding. And, um, and I think Ms. Whitaker's question was really uh, with respect to the scope of work of the consultant that we would yeah. be uh, bringing yeah. forward. But um, Julie, thank you for the response to that. Um, let's see, um, Bob, did you have a comment on that? Yeah, just real quick. That's a, that's a great question, um, Ms. Whitaker. Um, but there are actually two, um, there, are, there are two reviews going on. And so uh, the, the specific one that you asked about, that is a one-time uh, review, but that's really, that's uh, intended to help us more, I would say with the accounting and the control system. Whereas the one that will help us with uh, appropriate valuations, that will be ongoing. And, and my understanding is it's twice a year. So there's, these are really two different things. And so, I, and I agree with the approach that's taken. Once we figure out, I mean, <laughs> Ms. Underwood knows what she's doing, but uh, nonetheless, it's nice to, to bring someone in and say, hey, you know, am I getting this right with respect to recording these transactions into the system? But once we get that down, there's really no need, in my opinion, to come back next year and say, well, are we still doing the accounting right? Once you get that, you've kind of got it. Whereas the valuations, of course, are subject to annual change. Oh, gosh, actually daily changes in value, right? So it's, it's more important in that environment to have a consistent ongoing. So uh, that's a great question. And it highlights the distinction between these two features. And um, I, think they've, I think they're taking the right approach. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, any other comments or questions related to the um, the, the reporting item, uh, Mr. Rufino, Frank? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a, a quick comment. I, uh, the treasurer uh, is pleased and want to echo the comments from Dr. Yetman on the uh, work that the staff, uh, particularly Ms. Underwood and, and Chris, and, and uh, placing these new internal controls and detecting uh, early on. Um, uh, so great work, just wanted to echo again the, uh, how pleased we are and how, and, and congrats on, on the good work. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you, Frank. <clears throat> All right, um, so uh, Karen, let's uh, get to your item and this uh, relates to the repeat finding on member data uh, that you're right. referring to, right? Yes, yes. so um, Larry, do you wanna respond to that? Well, the particular details of those guidelines and things like that should be should really be addressed by our employer services area <clears throat> to reach out to see if, if they were available to um, address it more specifically. Okay. Um, and you know, the what I can share until they come online or if they are able to, um, is that you know, they do focus on the most, those, those uh, guidelines do focus on the most common types of issues that we see reporting errors. And so with regards to the special compensation uh, type of issues, um, those that 
should be um, you know recorded in the in the D, in the DBS rather than in the DB as you, as you said Karen and and so um, you know they they are focusing on those and those are what the the computer computer based training focuses on as well and available to them and and um, and they have been you know continuing to reach out and, and provide webinars as indicated in the third column here. The second column was the status as of January and then as of June. So they, you can see that they have made some, some progress there. And I tried to, to see if Jeff was available to address more specifically, but I, I don't, I haven't received a response okay. back yet. So um, we can reach out, out to him though and try to, try to um, provide you a better response and I can facilitate that if, if you'd like and, and okay. him, uh, give you some more specifics with regards to it. Okay, Cassandra, I see you, Han. Do you, do yeah, we, yeah, I sent him a note, and uh, if he comes back, if he comes back on, then we'll have him uh, pop in and answer the question a little bit more in detail than mm. than what we're able to answer right now. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, any other questions or comments on this item? Okay. Um, yeah, Karen, we'll return to that item uh, if when we have the appropriate. All right, thank you. Team member, or we come can on do board. it offline if, it, if it's not appropriate. Right okay, now. all right, sounds good. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the report on uh, item number three. Um, let me see, are, are there, uh, I should uh, see if there's any uh, public comment on this item. Um, Ger, uh, let me turn to you. Is there anyone in the queue? Just speak on there are no caller. There are no callers in queue right now for this item. Okay, thank you very much. All right, let's move on to item number four. Uh, this is an action item related to the 2021 internal audit plan. This is our mid-year progress report. Uh, let me turn to uh, Larry and to Roseanne for the report. Good yes, morning. thank you. Thank you. This is our, uh, as indicated, this is our mid-year progress report on our audit plan. And normally Mike Dutel is with us who, who's over our employer audit uh, section and, and he provides an overview of that. He's um, out today with a, he had a medical procedure and we just wish him the best and a speedy recovery. And he should be back with us next week. And so I'll provide an overview of the employer audit results and, and we we'll continue to make good progress. Um, as of mid-year, we've completed 57 of our 106 um, audits that are in the plan. And primarily the focus has been on limited scope audits. Um, we completed uh, 42 of those and 15 full scope audits. We have about 100, 100 audits that are in progress right now. Mostly, most of those are the limited scope audits. Um, most of the full scope audits uh, that we um, had in the plan are now nearly complete. And as you recall, when we heard rumors of office closures, audit services staff reached out to several of the school districts and finished gathering the information uh, needed that, to complete those audits. And then as, um, and so we're, we, we, we've completed almost all of those now. And so as soon as the travel restrictions are listed and then, and then also when school districts are, are able to host the auditors on site, we'll resume conducting the full scope audits. And, and we have found that it, it's just more efficient to be on site for these types of audits because of the volume of, of data that's reviewed. And so for those um, 15 full scope audits that were completed, we did find have 63 findings, which included like misreported compensation and post-retirement earnings, as well as unused sick leave. And then we also um, use data analytics to select employers with a greater likelihood um, of misreporting uh, in, in certain areas. And so for the 42 limited scope audits, we found an, an, an additional 63 findings. And most of that, 61 of those focused on special compensation. And so, um, so that was, it was a pretty, that was the issue that, that was really identified. And, and so overall we had 126 findings that impacted 64 retirees and 289 active members. And so the focus remains on trying to um, correct the, the active member uh, misreporting, you know, so that it doesn't become a problem later on. And then additionally, uh, 40, 41 out of the 57 or 72% had it, had it, of those audits had at least one systemic finding. And employer services continues to reach out 
um, to the employers uh, with systemic findings to assist with the corrections, and then also to provide training as necessary. And then finally, um, I'd like to mention that we also had nine employers that are shown in the attachment that had no audit findings. So that's almost 16%. And, and so that, that I think is terrific. And then uh, we're also making good progress in correcting the audit findings that are identified in the reports. And during this last uh, first half of the year, uh, 94 uh, from both the previous and current year were resolved. And so 162 remain in progress and, uh, and primarily uh, those are from the current year. And so uh, the teams are making, and, and, the, and the school districts are making good progress in, in, in processing those corrections. So if there's any questions about the uh, employer audit uh, findings, uh, if not, I'll just turn it over to Roseanne and, and she's gonna discuss the internal audit activities. Sure. Roseanne, why don't you go ahead and uh, present and we'll take questions after that. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. And good morning, uh, members of the ARM committee. For this reporting period, internal audits has completed two audits one of data privacy, focusing on the governance and practices to protect member information, and another of excess contribution returns for overpaid contributions returned to employers. The audits were positive and identified effective practices and did not identify any weaknesses or deficiencies in controls. In addition, we currently have three internal audits in progress. That's workforce and succession planning, technology procurement services, and production data and application deployment access. Internal audits also facilitated the completion of two audits by external audit firms, specifically a technology audit of the business direct application controls performed by Macias, Ginny, and O'Connell. I'm sorry, performed by Grant Thornton and an investment audit of global equity performed by Macias, Ginny, and O'Connell. There are an additional four contracted audits in progress that is cash management, two investment audits, one of innovative strategies and sustainable investment and stewardship strategies and the annual financial statement audit. I'd like to highlight some results from our completed audits. For the data privacy audit, internal audits noted that governance includes other entities, both inside and outside CalSTRS and policies were developed jointly with the information security office and other business areas. Both are consistent with leading practices. Enterprise Information Management also prepared a timeline for implementing the EIM tool to provide ongoing support for specific data privacy monitoring and inquiries. For the Business Direct IT Application Controls Audit, although mitigations and manual controls are in place, opportunities exist to implement automated controls in the system. The full summaries are located in attachment two, pages two through seven. During this reporting period, internal audits also validated the resolution of management actions. As of May 2021, management resolved 23 of 39 outstanding findings. That's about 60%. Numerous issues um, were related to the TCG audit um, from the prior committee report where, um, that were resolved through a collaborative effort between the program area and legal office. In this reporting cycle, two findings were added from audits completed in the end of the prior year. Next, inter internal audits would like to propose an adjustment to the 2021 audit plan, which will be presented by Larry Jensen. Yes, I, I was just wanted to let you know that I received uh, a message here that Jeff is online now. If you'd, if you'd like. Oh, great, okay. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, Betty. Good. Um, I'm not sure if you heard Ms. Yamamoto's question. Um, do you want to address that? On the, Absolutely. Uh, it, but specifically, Ms. Yamamoto, what did you want to know about the CBT specifically or the job aids? Um, I think the guidelines for employers, basically, and then anything in addition to the job aids that's um, other than CBT. Okay, absolutely. So without going into an unpacking of the entirety of our training channels and offerings, we have, of course, our air quotes in-person training that we conduct virtually now with the districts and counties. 
The CBTs regarding seven main teachers retirement law concepts, those are online and well used. And then we have job aids, which are new. And job aids are written documents that attempt to outline certain concepts, for example, creditable service. So it walks an employer through what are the concepts important to creditable service. So are you employed by an employer as defined by the teacher's retirement law? If yes, proceed. If no, it's not creditable. We're done right there. And then, of course, it gets much more complicated than that as we get into the different types of service, the nine categories of service. So those job aids are attempt to walk through what are potentially complicated topics around service and compensation. So now it doesn't get at every nuance of reporting. There are still outliers and very complex questions at a particular district or at an employer that we do, of course, handle on an ad hoc basis. If they have calls to us, we answer their question and provide them guidance about how to report that particular service or those earnings. So in short, the three main ways that we communicate formally with training is that virtual training, which will again be someday in person, the CBTs, and also these job aids, which is more of a written, I don't want to call it guidelines because we're not quite there yet, but it's certainly guidance about how to walk through these concepts when reporting. And then, of course, we're always there. We do our outreach and our conference calls with the employers to see if they have any training needs. And we answer questions in the moment and collaborate with legal services if it's a question of interpretation that we haven't yet uncovered. Okay. And so I guess the question on the, the job aids, the CBTs, I guess the consistency, because when we talk to various stakeholders, they yeah. say there is, the consistency is missing. And so that's why I asked about, in addition to the CBTs, computer-based training, um, you said you have guide, you don't have guidelines, but you have guidance. Guidance from the job aids, so, yeah. Right. And and the, so. Just so you know, the job aids, I understand and I've heard the same thing from our employers about consistency. However, in the training, the training is consistent. The training is developed by the employer services training and development team. So it's quality controlled within our area. Of course, we collaborate with service retirement if we're talking about working after retirement topics. We collaborate with subject matter experts as necessary, but in terms of the training from a CBT to a job aid, that will be consistent. What we're working on is making sure any ad hoc guidance that we provide when an employer calls us is also consistent with those trainings. And of course, that is our goal. So Good. I don't want to make too much of their concern about inconsistency, right. but I have right. heard the same concerns and we're certainly trying to address it. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you very much. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, Jeff. Sure. Controller, you, did you have a separate question? Uh, no, no. Okay. That was just a, uh, you covered all of that. Um, so really appreciate you topping on. Of course. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, back to Larry and Roseanne. Yeah. Just to, so that we can wrap up item number four, um, yes. we have an, an action item to address here. And, and um, you know, it's consistent with our charter uh, that the committee has to approve any changes to our audit plan. And so because of the changing risk environment and also we had uh, three staff vacancies um, since we first uh, developed the plan and, and, uh, and it was fully loaded with regards to our resources, we we're proposing to modify the 21 audit plan. And, and what we're suggesting is that we defer two audits. The first one is the recruitment audit that's in the plan and disaster recovery. So first, um, we're proposing deferring the audit of recruitment because it was one of the lower risk items when we, when we performed the risk assessment. And in addition to that, CalHR is performing certain functions within HR for compliance, including a review of recruitment at this time. And then second, we're proposed um, de deferring the disaster recovery audit until um, the data center migration project that's currently underway is fully implemented. And because it will be changing the internal control structure and, and adding additional mitigations as well uh, as part of that project, we reviewed the project documentation to ensure that it does address disaster recovery and efforts there. And so we're suggesting to defer that until it's implemented um, 
we can't audit what management hasn't done yet. And so at this point, um, we're suggesting just to defer that. Uh, in place though, we also pro propose providing um, some advisory services um, with regards to unresolved payments. And uh, to, and this kind of aligns with our, our changing risk profile. And the objective is to assess organizational controls to secure payments that are due to members, beneficiaries, and recipients of unpaid liabilities. And so this is, these are funds that the system is holding um, where we were, we haven't been able to um, finalize, finalize the payment yet, but we wanna make sure that those um, accounts are secure and that the controls are in place so that um, these monies that are due to our members and beneficiaries is, is, is secure and that the controls are, are, are adequate for, for, for issuing those types of payments. And then uh, finally, we'd like to just inform the ARM committee that there are some hours that are allocated in the 2021 audit plan that we're using to assist fiscal services in validating certain, certain benefit payments. And so our recommendation is, is, is really for approval of the modifications of the plan that, inc that include you know, the um, review of the unresolved payments in place of the recruitment audit, and then also deferring the disaster recovery audit until completion of the data, data center migration project. Great. Thank you, Larry. Uh, on the unresolved payment audit, um, so are the, um, are you, in terms of trying to resolve, um, res resolve amounts, are these, are, are, are the accounts um, suspended uh, until? Yeah, so, okay. yeah, so they, they may be, we have a, a whole host of different um, names that we have for them. One would be the suspended accounts. Uh -huh. Um, you know, um, and then there's other types of accounts that we have for different areas, you know, such as our, our disability and, and things like that. Any, anywhere we have that funds are due, um, you know, you may have heard them called dormant accounts uh -huh. recently. And so uh, at this point, they're just, you know, funds that are due to the members that, that we want to make sure that we have appropriate controls around. Uh, issuing those monies and making sure that it's accurate and, and, and approved. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm going to, um, before we go to uh, see if there's any public comment, um, I did have also a question for Roseanne. Um, and that is with regard to the um, business direct IT application controls audit. Um, I'm always looking to see whether um, things get better with respect to our Pens and Solutions project. And so um, could you talk about whether um, any of these identified issues um, will be better addressed once Pension Solutions comes online? And the, 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 the controls that, or the, the issues that were identified in the biz, yeah. business direct um, system are, um, are within the business direct, you know, opportunities within the business direct system. And, um, you know, we are, I think, working on um, making sure that the business direct and the pension solution, the new system work together. Um, but so hopefully, you know, um, if implemented because they do work together, it would um, improve, you know, the efficiencies or, and or the data integrity. Okay. So with, yeah, with pension solution, you know the the business direct will still exist and and it will in, interface with with mm -hmm. the, with the new system, and and so these controls are designed within the the business direct and and um, the, some of these controls you know that were that are suggested on here you know um, fiscal services has many manual workarounds and other controls that are in place. Uh, many of these that are identified here are opportunities to automate some of those controls so that when they do interface and, and the processing, uh, just the workflow is, is smoother and controlled um, you know, through an automated application versus some manual workarounds. Okay, I see Julie and Ashish um, comments on that. Yeah, so Madam Chair, uh, we are just working hand to hand with Julie's team in okay. the position. So I think weekly we meet together to just any either in internal controls or efficiency in the other existing system. Yeah. It's working out very good so far. Good, excellent. Julie, anything to add? 
Yeah, Larry and Ashish covered it, but one thing I just wanted to say specifically for item number seven is one of the findings that we identified that probably will um, um, be completely taken care of once Benefit Connect is, is implemented. So that's a, a, a finding specific to um, yeah. we see changes when that system is implemented. We'll take care of it. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I see it. Oh, go ahead. I just would like to add those those that appear to be the most serious issues. Um, fiscal services immediately addressed those and, and implemented those controls right away Good. Good. before issuance of the report. So we, we, we think they that was great. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, Ms. Whitaker, you have a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you to all the, the hard work that the audit team does. I do have a question for you, Larry, on the plan has, um, it was the first bullet on page two that said that there's 106 employer audits in the plan, and then there's 103 that are in process. And since this is the mid-year um, check-in, what is the likelihood or number of audits do you think that will be completed by the end of the fiscal year? Because it's almost the amount that was in the plan that are pending or, or, or in progress. Yeah. And so, so we've completed 57 today. Uh, we had 106 in our plan. So I expect that we will achieve that at that goal. And so, you know, there's always um, audits that are, that are in progress because uh, some of these will take three to, you know, five months to fully, you know, before we can issue a final report. And so in order to um, obtain that goal, we, we, we kind of manage the, the, we call it our pipeline, if you will, of, of these audits that are in progress um, to ensure that, you know, we, we uh, uh, obtain the goal. And, and I think that, you know, generally, um, you know, in order for us to, to meet it, uh, I think that, you know, about half of those that are in progress will be, have to be resolved. So let me just make sure I understand the math here. So 57 of the, the 106 for this plan have been completed. So part of the 103 are carryover from a previous year. Well, they were, they, um, they're not, let's see, they probably were started uh, in this year of the 57 that are complete. Some of those may have been, um, you know, started towards the latter part of, of last year. They would have been in progress then. So, so most of those that are in progress now, um, you know, were started during the current year. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. There's a, you know, there's like a, it takes a three to five months, depending on if there's issues that need to be reviewed by the legal office and things like that before issuing, you know, from, from initiation to final report. Okay, and and I I would be in favor of deferring other audits so that because I, I feel like the employer audits are very important to catch the mistakes and errors early on so that they don't linger on or other mistakes or or changes are made to people's retirement. So I was just curious if there's a plan for those 103 in progress to get as many done um, this fiscal year as as possible. So so th uh, that's a, a good a good thought, and I appreciate that support there. Um, we actually divide the plan between the employer audits and internal audits and the resources accordingly. So with regards to resources for completing employer audits, we're on track and we have the, the, the resources that, that we need in order to, to achieve that. These are on the internal audit uh, side of the plan, if you will, um, and, and those that are you know, uh, not employer audits, but those that are conducted internally. And, and so that's where the that's where we're we have some recruitments underway right now that uh, for those that staff turnover and um, and and but because of those deficiencies and then also because of the change in the risks um, that's why we're we're suggesting that when we create the plan we fully load the resources and so we count on everybody being there and if we have a, a you know turnover like that then it it can impact the ability to achieve it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Whitaker. Mr. Bartow, I see you have your hand raised. Yes, uh, thank you. So um, I think this is the right place to address it since um, Larry mentioned the charter and revisiting the, the work plan. So I'm addressing this as the general counsel to the committee. Um, you know, every year audits does a risk assessment and comes out and speaks with us and uh, they speak with me as part of that process. 
And every year for at least the last four years, I have specifically requested that they audit internal procurement processes within the branch level, that we have individual branches that are doing their own procurement processes. And when we get the draft contracts up in legal, we see recycled language, we see old contracts, we see scope of work that may not be, um, may not be adequately described or that may be stretched. And so since I haven't been able to get audit services to do these internal audits that I've asked for every year, I thought I would address it to you. It is, to me, it is a significant legal risk when we have, uh, we have a decentralized contract and procurement process. And so I do think, I know that your um, responsibility is to help allocate the resources. And I just want to, um, I want to place this sort of as a flag if not this year, next year. To me, this as the chief legal officer of the organization, this is a high priority. I don't necessarily have visibility when uh, technology services uh, starts drafting a contract or enters into a contract or other branches. And I wanna know uh, what procedures and policies and internal controls they have in place. So again, this is um, a request I'm making uh, to the committee. And, you know, I. Related to this, and I know we haven't gotten to it yet, but item six is a uh, you know, quality review. And on page 19, I noticed all the folks that were interviewed and it did not include the general counsel, nor did it include the board's consultant. So I'm very concerned that this legal risk isn't being adequately addressed. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bartow. Um, and uh, these are uh, issues raised that are um, tangential to the item at hand, but they are important issues. I would ask that uh, Mr. Jensen, if you'll take them back and happy to take the conversation offline in terms of what we can do to begin to uh, address some of these. Um, yeah, yeah, I am, I'm happy to do that. I, okay. And I will. I, I would, however, like to point out um, to the committee and also to, to Brian there that, um, you know, we, we heard you, Brian. And, and, you know, I think Roseanne mentioned that we have a technology procurement services audit that's in progress right now. And so we are um, trying to address your concern, uh, you know, based on our resources, we thought that we'd start with the IT area. We, in fact, just had a, a, an exit conference. And so we're, we're wrapping up a preliminary exit conference. And so we're wrapping that up and we'll be issuing a report um, here shortly. And, um, you know, can, happy to share, you know, the results of that with you as well. And um, so we're starting with procurement services. And I think that, you know, in next year's plan, um, we'll, we'll also be looking at other areas in the organization with regards to their procurement activities. And so, um, you know, we are trying to address it based on, um, you know, the, the risk assessment that's performed and, and, and trying to address address those risks. And, and if I might, you know, just with regards to the interviews that the quality assurance team conducted, um, you know, that, that was a random sample selection that they, it wasn't, you know, my suggestion or anything like that. Um, I don't, I didn't, don't know exactly who they reached out to. So, um, you know, until I, until I saw the report myself. And so, um, trying to address those concerns, but I just want to let the committee know and, and also Brian and, and then happy to have, you know, further discussion with you with regards to specific areas and the controls that we're, we're reviewing and identifying. Yeah. I, I appreciate yeah. that. This is actually the first uh, communication I've had about this assessment. So yeah. I think um, to, you know, just to end this at this point, I, I'd really like some more communication uh, from your team about how they're addressing this audit and these risks. Um, yeah. So I think you're right, uh, Betty, I think we can take this offline. I, I wanna follow up and see exactly uh, what what pieces we're looking at, so. Sure, no, yeah. and I appreciate you raising it and thank you for the response, Larry. Um, let us do some more work on this. Um, it also suggests to me that um, sometimes um, decisions perhaps are being driven by uh, resources available, and I want to be sure those are aligned with priorities that really need to be addressed um, that pose um, some potentially extraordinary risks. And so um, let us have that conversation. I'm happy to be a part of that too. So I will um, coordinate uh, just uh, the conversation going forward about how we Thank look you. at that. Uh, before we go to public comment, we have a question by Mr. Rafino, and then I'd like to turn to Mr. Getman before we go to public comment. Okay, Frank, please. 
Um, Madam Chair, thank you. Just a quick observation, and I'm not sure if this applies, but the, uh, <clears throat> with respect to procurement, the Department of General Services usually grants delegate authority uh, to individual departments to uh, administer their procurement process, and they do periodically audits. And I was just curious to know, uh, number one, whether the Department of General Services, when was the last time that they audited uh, CalSTRS and what were their findings, if any, uh, <clears throat> and whether or not, you know, uh, the CalSTRS internally has uh, their procurement process aligns with DGS in order to obtain the delegation. So I just want to make that quick comment. I'm not sure if, if CalSTRS falls under that a statute, but typically DGS, the Department of General Services, uh, is responsible to make sure that departments comply with their internal guidelines in order to be granted delegation to purchase. Yes, Mr. Barto. Yes, we're we're fully delegated, and um, I, I do want to uh, differentiate from uh, my comments were about uh, branch level procurement. Our general uh, procurement, our contract section is regularly reviewed and audited, and we do follow uh, DGS processes uh, on much of our contracting, although we do have some independence. And as you know, we have some statutory uh, language that we hope to be approved to give us some independence in our uh, investment procurement area. Uh, but we very much follow those processes and procedures. And our procurement is centralized and it is reviewed. Uh, my comments were really directed to uh, these sort of offline procurements. So hopefully that answers Thank your question. You. Sure, yeah. Thank you, uh, Council. But just a follow-up question. When was the last time that we, the CalSTRS got audit or had a compliance audit from DGS? Um, well, I've been General Counsel for over 10 years and um, certainly not in the last 10 years. Because we're delegated, they wouldn't necessarily have that, have that function. Okay, so typically, you know, the, in order to renew the delegation, they would need to uh, perform a compliance review. But, uh, but anyways, I think we, we're getting into the weeds, uh, Madam Chair, so I'll, I'll trust offline that you guys will have, uh, you know, we'll take a and look. And I'll follow up. Issue. Yes, thank I'll you. I'll follow up on that, Madam Chair, and, and then uh, communicate back. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Getman, I want to just get your um, observations on the report before we go to public comment. Right, happy Madam Chair. So we're um, on item four, as you know, which is an action item. Yeah. So the board's going to have to vote. Um, I've talked with Larry extensively about um, the, uh, the changes inside the uh, internal audit plan, and I think they're appropriate. I would recommend that the board uh, votes to approve the audit plan as presented in the documents. All right. Thank you, Mr. Gettman. All right. Um, seeing no other questions or comments by committee members, Gurr, let me speak, um, turn to you. Are there any members of the public who wish to address the committee on this there item? Are no, there are no callers in queue right now for this item. Okay. Thank you, Gurr. All right. Uh, we have the item before us. It is an action item uh, with respect to the uh, changes that were enumerated by Larry and Roseanne, uh, is there a motion? Um, I'll move recommendation of the, of the item. Great, thanks, Ms. Higa. Motion by Joy, the second, second by Ms. Yamamoto. Okay, uh, Trevor, please call the roll, please. Ms. Higa? Aye. Ms. Yamamoto? Aye. For the Director of Finance, Ms. Whitaker? Aye. For the State Treasurer, Mr. Rufino? Aye. For the Superintendent of Public Instruction, Mr. Johnson? Aye. Controller Yee, would you like to vote? Yes, I, uh, Controller Yee, aye. The motion passes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, appreciate the robust discussion on this with some uh, follow-up to come. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, moving on to item number five. This is an information item. Uh, this is also a mid-year progress report uh, relating to our 2021 Enterprise Compliance Services Plan. And uh, for this item, we have uh, Cheryl. Good, good morning. morning. Yes, good morning. It's good to see everyone. Looking forward to seeing everyone in person. 
So today I'm going to highlight uh, some key areas of progress that ECS has made on our 2021 compliance plan. The three areas are the identification and continued oversight of CalSTRS compliance obligations, refinement of our compliance risk and monitoring efforts, as well as increased awareness of compliance and ethics. So related to the identification and continued oversight of CalSTRS compliance obligations, ECS worked closely with various branches within the organization to identify and develop an external compliance reporting matrix. Now this matrix um, lists the reports, disclosures, and filings that <laughs> CalSTRS is required to submit to external agencies, such as um, legislature, the governor, Department of Finance, the state controller's office. So as you can see in the attachment, um, ECS identified 55 reports that CalSTRS is required to submit to external agencies. We plan, ECS plans to publish this data in more detail for the organization. And that detail will include the name description of each report, who's responsible for developing that report, the frequency of submission, um, the legal requirement associated with that report, and any required deadlines. Then from there, ECS will periodically update that matrix and monitor it for compliance. Now, I just wanted to point out that the identification and development of this matrix is another component to building awareness, enterprise awareness of CalSTRS compliance obligations. And also in the same um, area, ECS continues to work with the organization to ensure our policies and standards are um, consistent, current, and relevant. Then secondly, ECS has worked on refining our compliance risk efforts through collaboration with enterprise risk management internal and internal audits. So together we integrated and harmonized certain shared risk processes in order to um, create efficiencies and reduce redundancies. And then separately, um, ECS, we developed a two question survey to gain some insight um, on the organization's knowledge and awareness of its compliance requirements as it relates to individuals' jobs, job duties. Um, and we had a great response. We had 61% response rate that was representative of the organization. And those results are gonna assist ECS in our compliance risk assessment process, but it also allows us to um, work with the business areas to increase awareness and embed controls within, within certain processes of the organization to address any of those knowledge gaps that we find you know, through this survey. And then the results of our compliance risk assessment as well as the progress on our monitoring will be presented in November to the committee. So lastly, I just wanted to address that um, we've increased awareness of compliance and ethics through various compliance initiatives. We first partnered with the enterprise risk management um, team to insert some compliance education into CalSTRS annual risk and internal control um, awareness training. ECS also provided training, training to 20 contract managers um, throughout the organization on receipt and review of the system and organizational control reports that are submitted to third party from third party vendors. So this is important because it's a part of our due diligence over third parties and it provides CalSTRS information on our vendors control environment as it relates to the services they provide us. And then lastly, um, we continue to learn and identify areas to educate on as it relates to our hotline reports. So for instance, we identified um, opportunities to clarify the purpose of the hotline to our external stakeholders and members. Um, how we did this was, for instance, we found that some reports from our external stakeholders didn't necessarily address compliance and ethical concerns, but rather were more customer service oriented. So we wanna work with our business areas, the relevant business areas to perform some member or stakeholder outreach to um, communicate, okay, for customer service type questions like service retirement benefit questions, you would go here. But if you have a compliance or ethical concerns such as pension abuse, then this is how you would reach out with the hotline. Oh, sorry, I said that was lastly, but I had one more component. We also um, developed a case management reference guide to assist with timely response of those hotline reports and ensure that those reports are actually accurately captured in our system so that we can perform some data analytics and we can learn again from the hotline reports. So in closing, I'm excited with our progress and I look forward to updating you in the future 
um, with how we're doing. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Uh, a lot of progress and really appreciate the report. Um, I may have missed this, but um, to Mr. Rufino's question, I know you've also uh, begun meeting with procurement in terms of building a library of uh, processes. Could you comment on that? Yes, I'm glad you asked that. Thank you. So they're one of the first areas that we're working on. And as we build that library, we're trying to understand, and it's funny because Brian mentioned contract management, and that's the first item on my list is to understand the process, the higher level processes and their re re you know, regulatory requirements, the controls related to it, so that we can then um, try to work with them on embedding controls, maybe making it easier for the contract managers even that are not in that centralized in the procurement itself to um, make sure that we're meeting our compliance obligations. So it's a new thing. I just um, went to a training, it was great. And it talks about how do we reduce judgment and then just embed those controls where we just can go ahead and know, yep, this is when we do this, we need to do that. So we're gonna, we're gonna first understand that process and then together work, to work with procurement, legal, any other stakeholders to see where it would be a great opportunity to embed controls. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, are there questions or comments? I have one. Larry, please. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, the the issues or the risks that were um, presented to the committee, you know, were, were known and included in the compliance risk. <coughs> and, um, and, you know, we've had some discussions about how does audit services and compliance services coordinate those activities and what's the differences and things like that. You know, we knew that we knew that compliance um, was going to be, um, you know, providing this type of monitoring over the over the procurement controls, and and so uh, one of the things we talked about was, you know, let compliance kind of do their job, and then and then if there is some significant deficiencies that are identified, um, you know, the compliance area will inform us, and and it may you know trigger an audit at that point in time to really do some testing on the effectiveness of the controls and the adequacy of the controls. And so I, I think it's working and, and it seems to, you know, the collaboration is, is strong and, and um, you know, we we're monitoring what each other are doing. And, and so I think, you know, through that kind of an approach, you know, I, I, I think it's, I think, you know, we're going to, we're going to get there. <laughs> so, um, you know, but good report, Cheryl. Thank you very much. It's it's interesting to see the growth there because we have a, a great understanding now of the applicable laws, rules, and regulations to us, and policy management process in place. Also, with regards to understanding our, our compliance risks and our in our hotline reporting processes, and and now we're maturing to the point where, from an enterprise perspective, understanding you know the reporting external reporting requirements that that we have as an organization, and so great growth and, and maturity in the in the program. And just thank you for the good report, Cheryl. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Getman, Bob. Oops, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, continue to be pleased with the progress we see in the compliance function. It's um, as we all know, it's a fairly new area for the organization, not compliance, but a separate compliance function is fairly new for the organization. And Cheryl stepped into it um, and has really taken, taken ownership of it. And um, as you know, whenever you take on something as big as compliance, the biggest problem you have up front is trying to scope out exactly what it means and how it fits the organization, right? And, and that's the hardest part, I think, which was, there's a lot of writings on what compliance is and what compliance means. And finding how do you take this wealth of best practices and procedures and tailor that to the specific organization that you live within, because it also needs to meld with the internal audit function that already exists. And so um, I think in the, uh, in the beginning, that was certainly very, it's very challenging to do that. And so what we see is a, a rapidly maturing um, compliance function, but let's let's be honest, it's still it's still in its infancy, and it still has um, a lot to go. And um, Cheryl's made wonderful progress with uh, the, the the limited staffing over time that she's had to work with, 
And, um, and remember, there hasn't been a long track record, right? She had to start from scratch, not a complete scratch, but you know, pretty much started anew. And so um, I think the progress that's been made is, is very pleasing. Um, I would recommend that we uh, continue on the path, but at the same time, recognize that this is, uh, this is like a, a child, everything's, everything's sort of new and we have to foster it and, and help it grow as it goes along. We can expect some hiccups. We can expect some mistakes. That's natural. And, um, but I'm really pleased with uh, the direction that it's heading and the pace with which it's uh, uh, growing. And I would urge that we um, maintain quality and rigor uh, over speed and, and let it grow uh, over time um, organically uh, into itself. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob, very much. Um, really uh, want to echo the comments, tremendous progress and Cheryl uh, by your mighty team of how many now? Four. Four. Okay, there you go. Uh, thank you. Um, and particularly with respect to just elevating, anytime there's an elevation of enterprise compliance, it's uh, always to the good. So uh, in the process of uh, putting all this together, I really appreciate that um, added benefit as well. Thank you. All right, thank you. We will receive that report. Um, so uh, let me see if there are any members of the public or who wish to comment on this item. There are no callers, thank you right now for this item. Okay, thank you very much. All right, uh, next we'll move on to item number six. This is the 2021 External Quality Assessment Review, the audit of the auditors, if you will. So uh, let me turn to Larry for that. Yes, uh, thank you. Oh, I'm just checking to make sure I'm unmuted there. So, so the, our, our professional audit standards uh, require that we have an external quality assessment review at least every five years. And, and the last review was performed in 2016 and presented to the committee at the, at the um, right at the beginning of 2017, actually. And so the standards also require that the chief auditor, you know, present the results of the assessment to the committee. And, and for this engagement, we reached out to the Institute of Internal Auditors Quality Services uh, area, uh, business line, if you will, and, and they were engaged to perform this quality assurance review uh, of audit services. And the objective of these types of reviews is to determine the extent of conformance uh, with the international standards for the professional practice of internal auditing. Um, and also the IIA um, is the organization that, that promulgates these standards. And so we actually had a, a team from, from the Institute of Internal Auditors, you know, look at our, our practices. And one of the other things they look at is also alignment with, um, you know, leading internal audit practices. And, and the IIA assessors that uh, performed this review, they were very experienced. They've also performed other reviews of, of pension systems, such as the Washington State Investment Board and, and the teachers, um, Texas Teachers Retirement System. So they're familiar with, with, um, with pension systems. And so the, uh, according to their assessment results, their overall opinion was that audit services generally conforms uh, with the standards for that, or with the IIA standards, as well as the IIA code of conduct, and that's on attachment one, page one. And um, you can see there that it illustrates all general conformance. And this is the, the top or the, uh, the highest rating that, that's possible under the assurance guidelines. And so as illustrated um, on page one there, you know, we obtain this general conformance. And, and I think it's, it's good to note that um, this is an improvement over our 2016 report where we had some partial conformance that was noted for some of the standards and we put a plan in place and kept the committee informed about the progress that we we're making and and we and we had good success with that as as noted in the report they also have some um, observations with regards to successful internal audit practices that are on attachment to page one and they they highlight those and i just wanted to share that with the committee and then they also note one gap to conformance. And in that area, um, the, their, their concern is that audit services should insert, ensure that all of their, our staff has sufficient uh, knowledge with regards to key IT risk and controls and available technology-based audit techniques. And so um, 
as you might be aware, most of our IT um, information technology and information security audits um, are contracted out. Um, we use our, our vendor pool for those uh, more complex, uh, sophisticated types of, of audits. And so, um, however, um, there are um, some aspects of IT that could be incorporated into most of our audits and, and that staff could perform. And so, um, while most of our focus on training has been in some other fundamental areas in the last couple of years, uh, it, um, it's good to see that, you know, we're progressing to the point that we can have this type of training now. And, and so, in fact, we've ar arranged for IT audit training for all of our staff uh, later this year, and we'll begin incorporating uh, this recommendation. And so I think it's uh, important and, and, uh, and, we're, and we concur with that. Um, they also have some opportunities for continuous improvement. And there's one key one that I'd like to, like to discuss there. And, and it's with regards to the, the use of the statement conforms with international standards for the professional practice of internal auditing. That statement is included in all of our internal audit reports. However, it is not included in the reviews that were conducted for employer audits. Uh, as part of the assessment, uh, they looked at the type of work that we do and the extent of work and the extent of conformance with the standards. And, and, um, and in the past, um, we were not allowed to use that statement. And, and the reason why is because there's some areas of the standards that simply were not part of the compliance reviews that were performed. In other words, we're not doing a, a, a fraud assessment of the employer. And we're not also looking at all of their internal processes and evaluating their internal control structure, right? And so, so we were not in the past allowed to use that. In the last couple of years, the IIA has changed um, their opinion with regards to that and, and has said that if you substantially conform with the standards, uh, that we can use that statement in our employer audit reports. And so, um, we're, we, we will be doing that going forward. And in fact, we, we will no longer call them reviews as we have in the past. We will refer to them as audits. And, um, and, then, and then we will note that it doesn't include the fraud assessment or the, the internal control assessments, as I, as I mentioned. And so um, to me, I think that that's great because it, it's a reflection of the good work that goes on there. And then, and then they also focus on... Um, you know, continuing to mature our, our data analytics and, and use of automated tools, as, as well as suggesting that we, that we reach out and market our services uh, a little more throughout the organization. And, and um, you know, one of the things that they did was they did conduct a survey, um, you know, that, that went out to all of our directors and managers and, and received input from them. And so it was very comprehensive. Um, you know, we concurred with all of the recommendations there, um, you know, and it, it really, um, you know, is something that we will work for. We will work towards implementing these recommendations and, and improving, continuing to grow and mature our processes internally as well, and keep the committee informed of the, of the progress that we make. And we have a, an ongoing quality improvement program and, and we'll just incorporate it into there. And, and so the full report, while these are just some excerpts from the report, the full report is posted to Diligent now. And uh, so the board does have access to that full report. Thank you very much, Larry. Uh, and thank you for making the report available as well. Um, very helpful to have it as uh, just sort of a, a touchstone with respect to uh, some of the observations that were made. Um, I don't see any questions, Bob. Let me turn to you. No. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would encourage the board to um, take a glance at the full report. It's not, it's not that long. Um, it, it's, it's, not an, it's not an afternoon of enjoyable reading, I understand. But um, I think going through the report will um, provide a, a good understanding of exactly what this audit was all about. It happens every five years under IIA standards. and. Um, the IIA uh, organization sets the standards for how internal audits should be conducted. And so Larry chose to get that very same organization 
to do an audit of their own standards. Um, you don't have to use IIA as the auditor. You can um, have other, you can hire an accounting firm, an external accounting firm to come in and do these audits if you want. The, um, the, but really, uh, I think it's nice that the IIA actually did this audit because they wrote the standards and they don't miss a thing. So really you only wanna bring these folks in to do an audit if you're pretty sure you're in good shape. So that alone would be a pretty strong signal. When you ask these guys to do the audit, you better have your ducks in a row because they're not gonna miss anything. After all, they wrote the standards. The second thing I think is important to understand is what this really is an audit of. It was not an audit of CalSTRS internal control systems or uh, financial reporting systems or you know, legal reporting systems. It was not an audit of those items at all. Instead, it was an audit of CalSTRS internal audit function and how the internal audit team conducts its audits. Is it up to snuff with respect to training and procedures? And so um, the IIA decides the scope of the audit and what procedures they conduct and who they talk to in accordance to their own standards. And these standards, as I said, are designed to give the board assurance that the internal audit function is following, is following standards. Um, that means that they're meeting those standards with respect to how internal audits are performed. So it's not an audit of the organization itself. And I think that's an important distinction to understand. Um, next, I'd like to uh, point out, I think it's a little accounting humor here. So if you go to attachment one, item six, page one, there's three columns, right? It says generally conforms, partially conforms, and does not conform. And some of you might be wondering, well, where's the column that says it actually conforms, right? <laughs> where's the column that says, oh, things are good. Well, being accountants, we don't like to have columns like that. <laughs> so generally conforms is the highest level you can possibly get. There is nothing higher than generally conforms. Only an accountant would use the term generally conforms to mean it meets the highest standard that it does. And second, if you look down, you'll see there's an X in every box of the generally conforms. And as Larry pointed out five years ago in 2016, that was not the case. And then in fact, if we go back even deeper for those of us who have been around that long, um, there were some nonconformities. And so what we've seen is a, a rapid increase um, under Larry's guidance to where we are today. And uh, that is just a real feather in, um, in, in, in uh, Larry's cap and then in internal audit as well. And of course, Cheryl was since moved, but uh, played a role in that as well. So I wouldn't wanna leave uh, her contributions out as well. So. Um, I, this is not an action item. However, I am great, great, greatly pleased. And uh, the board can expect to see a similar report. Hopefully it'll be just as great coming through five years from now. And uh, gosh, uh, <laughs> 2026. Hmm. Great, thank you, Bob, very much. Okay, um, so let me uh, turn to Gurr. Any uh, public comment on this item, Gurr? No, no members of the public for this item. Okay, very well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the report and um, just uh, really pleased with the, uh, with the observations and, um, and thank you also for making it available on Diligent for the committee members and the board to, to access. Yeah, if, if I could, I'd just like to acknowledge the work of, you know, all of our staff and audit services. It, it takes everybody, you know, to get these type of ratings and it's the everyday work that's done by the by our staff, you know, to ensure that it, their work conforms the, with the standards that they're doing their due diligence and things like that. And so, just like to acknowledge all of our staff, and and then also the arm committee for you know they look at the oversight role, they look at our agenda items, things like that. So you know, I just think all around, you know, great great performance from staff, and and appreciate you know the 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 good work of the committee. So thank you. Thank you, Larry, very much. All right, uh, we are now on item number seven. That's this, the draft agenda for the next committee meeting, um, which will be um, November. our no November meeting. This is our crunch meeting, as yeah. <laughs> I like to refer to it. Uh, quite busy. Uh, any um, any uh, 
highlights or observations. I think it's pretty explanatory. Yeah, like yeah. These will episode. review. Well, Crow will be with us. They'll, yes. they'll be, um, you know, presenting their opinion as well as the results of the financial statement audit. And and if there is a management letter, we'll have some discussion about that on any any uh, thing that might be, come up as a result of the audit. And then we'll also have for the committee our our enterprise compliance plan for 2022. Right. as well as our new internal audit plan. And, and, and that will include a refresh of our risk assessment for the committee's review. We had some discussion today with regards to, you know, overall risk and how we develop the plan. And so that will be included in our next uh, agenda as well. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Okay, um, let me uh, now turn, uh, we have another opportunity for statements from the public. Uh, Ger, any, any uh, members of the public? Yes, we do have one member of the public in queue. Okay. Good morning. Okay, our first caller is Randy. Randy, go ahead. Yes, thank you, um, Madam Chair and uh, members of the board. I was um, one, thinking about doing this during the, the regular uh, meeting, but I I'm, I'm, can certainly do it now. Um, Again, thank you for the, for the opportunity to, to say a few words. My name is Randy Harris, and I'm a member of the Laborers International Union of North America's Midwest region. And uh, we represent 50,000 construction laborers across 10 states in the Midwest. And we've been assisting current and former workers who are abused by blue, co blue sky construction sites. Um, just as a little background, Blue Sky Restoration is a portfolio company of Dominus Capital and Harbor Vest Partners. CalSTRS is exposed to Blue Sky through these relationships. Blue Sky does not directly employ construction craft labor, but instead relies on a network of subcontractors and staffing agencies. I wanted to update the board today on some recent developments with the company and recommend some actions to eliminate the labor abuses and risk to your fund that we see. In case the board is not familiar with Blue Sky, I'd like to offer some background and information about the company to date. I want to stress these are only issues and concerns that we have found through tireless effort. It's not everything that is out there on Blue Sky, just what we've been able to find. Uh, major issues include the issue of unpaid wages. Uh, summer of 2020, the city of Minneapolis launched an investigation into potential wage violations that occurred at a strip mall in Minneapolis, where Blue Sky was handling the cleanup from the George Floyd protests. The supervisor claimed most employees at the work site made $12 per hour. The minimum wage for large businesses in Minneapolis is $13.25 per hour, as of July 1st, 2020. In the fall of 2020, a group of six workers on a Blue Sky project in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, joined with community groups to recover over $30,000 in wages that were owed to them. The workers have been told that they would receive $250 per day for their work. Blue Sky is also one of two parties named as a defendant in an ongoing Minnesota federal lawsuit filed in 2019 that alleges violations of federal and state laws, including the Fair Labor Standards Act, the Minnesota Fair Labor Standards Act, and the Minnesota Payment of Wages Act. Recent declarations filed by a worker participating in the case alleges Blue Sky falsified timekeeping practices in North Carolina, which resulted in workers losing dozens of hours worth of compensable work time and hundreds of dollars in overtime wages in 2020. We also have the issue of failure to pay subcontractors. In March 2021, Blue Sky subcontractors, I'm sorry? You have 30 seconds, Randy. Oh, you only get 30 seconds. Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, thank you for your uh, time. Uh, thank you very much for your comments. And um, you always um, uh, address your comments in writing as well to the committee. And okay. Okay. Thank you. Gerd, do we have any other speakers from the public? That concludes public comment for this item. Very well. Thank you very much. All right, members, um, I think uh, any other business to come before the committee? Um, seeing none, um, uh, we are adjourned. And uh, Mr. Keeley, um, time for? Sure. Start the how, how about 10.30? I think it's about uh, 12 minutes. So, sure. so we'll, we'll convene at uh, 10.30. Great. Thanks, everyone. Morning, everyone. Welcome to the Cowsters board meeting. It's nice to see you all via virtual. 
can't wait for us all to be together in person again sometime, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, we have staff to take the roll, please. Roxlyn, you're on mute. <laughs> okay, that is the uh, phrase of the pandemic. So thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. So, um, Ms. Hendricks? Here. Ms. Bradford? Here. Ms. Higa? Here. Mr. Prezant? Here. Ms. Erdan? Here. Ms. Yamamoto? Here. Okay, and so, um, I'm sorry, who will be representing? Will that be Ms. Whitaker representing um, the Department of Finance? Yeah. Department of Finance, thank you. Um, and so then, let's see, it's hard to see you guys. Mr. Rufino um, representing. Um, President. Yoma. Great, thank you. And then, uh, Mr. Johnson, are you representing Mr. Th Thurman today? Yes. Great, thank you. And then Controller Yi. I'm here. Great, thank you very much. So Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thanks, Ms. Bell. So as you, as we all know, our meetings are live stream. Um, after each agenda item, there will be 10 minutes for public comment. And then there will be a general public comment at the end of the meeting for up to 30 minutes. A live stream. So if you're under 18 years of age, we ask that you just uh, mention your name uh, and no other information, and you will not be video screened that ticket. And with that, uh, entertain a motion to approve today's agenda. I moved. Your second. Second. Without objection, the agenda has been approved. Item two on the agenda is the uh, 2021 meeting work plans uh, for the upcoming year for the board, as well as uh, the committees. And we have our chief executive officer here, Cassandra Lipnot. Cassandra, if you want to comment on any of the work plans that are in front of us, uh, and or does any of the committee members want to discuss any of them? I'll turn it over to you, Cassandra. Thank you, uh, Chair Keeley. The only thing that I wanted to comment relative to September is that um, the work plan has the proposed operating budget concepts on there and the enterprise risk management report. Those weren't listed on the agenda, but we did put those on a, an agenda and send that back out to the board uh, for approval. So that'll be at the, that we can approve um, at the end of the meeting. But I wanted to point those out that we had added those back on. Thanks very much, Cassandra. Uh, any, any questions? I see our the general counsel, Mr. Bartow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to, on the, uh, the board governance committee, there's a work pl uh, plan in there. I'd, uh, I'd like it uh, approved um, subject to some revisions. We've just started meeting with the chair and vice chair and the uh, board's governance consultant. And we expect that we may add some additional items or replace some of the items on the work plan as we move forward. Yep, thanks very much, uh, Brian. And in fact, I was going to uh, suggest to my colleagues that we adopt all of these work plans with some flexibility. If we've learned nothing else in the last 15 months, I think we need to be flexible where we are, where we can be, and things may arise that uh, cause us to create some changes. To the extent we can stay focused and disciplined on the work plan, we will. But as matters arise, I think we should address them as they are necessary. So thank you, thank you. Brian. Uh, Karen, Ms. Yamamoto. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was looking at the April offsite. Are there any plans for that as yet, or is that still part in the flexibility mode? I think that I would, uh, I think that's in the flexibility mode as far as um, what I understand at this point. So it'll be developing. Okay, thank you. Thanks, thanks Cassandra. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I see our board governance consultant. Ms. McDuffie, Amy, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I thought what I would offer if uh, the board is interested is just a quick preview. We have been 
uh, as Brian mentioned, meeting with the leadership of the Board Governance Committee. And I'd be happy to do just a really brief snippet, if you like, as Thank a preview. Okay. Well, thanks. I think, uh, Mr. Chair, you mentioned it, which is uh, maintaining flexibility. And I think we can all agree that uh, the landscape has shifted dramatically. And that gives us a unique opportunity to revisit and then reaffirm or refresh practices that can ensure the board's governance continue to be fit for purpose. And of course, that within the broader bro backdrop of the fact that the well of good governance at CalSTRS runs very deep. So we're looking at this on a continuum. Uh, the board governance committee has always focused on best practices and governance and bringing those forward under the broader mantra of best practices can be found anywhere. It's just a matter of how you translate those. And so that indeed is the shape of what we've been talking about with Mr. Prezant and Ms. Erden as committee leadership. That's their intent is to continue a strong focus on best practices and governance. Uh, questions that we've been talking about for exploration with the committee have uh, really been initiated by all the conversations you've had in your meetings this year. So here are some of the things that we've been discussing in terms of questions for the work plan. What's the board role now? What should it look like in the future? How should it be evolving? How does the board want to organize its work? What models of committees could be beneficial? Uh, for example, you have your standing committees, your ad hoc committees, work groups. What specific committees and committee configurations best support the board's work and why? What are the best practices of various institutions, including corporates, nonprofits, public pension peers, when it comes to committees, how can you leverage and support those at CalSTRS and how do all these answers align with the board's current governance structure? So the broad umbrella theme here is effectiveness and efficiency in alignment with best practices. We're going to see and we'll be working with board leadership as we approach this upcoming offsite. Is there any part of the board self-evaluation segment, for example, that could be leveraged uh, to start these conversations so we can capture the sentiment of the full board on some of those higher level questions and then use that to shape the work plan for the board governance committee. So it's going to be another exciting year. We're going to continue to uh, leverage the governance forums, the education forums on the work plan, maybe not for every meeting, but certainly to deliver targeted education opportunities for the board and governance. So that's the preview, best practices, effectiveness, efficiency. I think it aligns well with what you all have been asking for over the last year, but I'd certainly defer to uh, the board governance committee leadership for any additional comments that you'd like to provide. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. McDuffie. Uh, Mr. Persant or Ms. Erden, do you want to um, contribute any further on uh, Amy's comments? I have nothing really further. Uh, we have had a couple of uh, sort of uh, uh, Zoom calls with uh, Brian and uh, Jennifer and Amy and myself, uh, which have been very helpful uh, fleshing out some of these issues and look forward to working with leadership and the rest of the board to uh, continue uh, the great collaborative governance model that we've had over the years. And uh, maybe we can fine tune it here and there to even make it just a tad better. We can always improve. So anyway, thank you very much, Amy, and thank you, Brian. And of course, thank you to Jennifer, uh, uh, who's been a tremendous amount of help. Thanks. Thanks so much, Bill. Appreciate your willingness and Jennifer's to, to lead this committee this year for us. And we look forward to uh, learning from your expertise. And as you said, continue to work towards uh, improvement on something that's working well. So thank you both very much. Thanks, Amy. I don't see any other hands. Um, so the recommendation is to adopt the work plans and schedule uh, with some flexibility as identified. And uh, Ms. Bell, could you take the roll please? Um, so is there a motion um, made to adopt the work plan? Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Okay. Second. Okay, it's been moved and properly second. Okay, great, thank you. Yep. All right, um, so Mrs. Hendricks? Yes. Ms. Bradford? Yes. Ms. Higa? Yes. Mr. Prezant? Yes. Ms. Erdan? Yes. Um, Mrs. Yamamoto? Aye. Um, Ms. Whitaker? Yes. 
Mr. Rafino? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. And Controller Yee? Aye. All right, thank you. And would you like to vote Mr. Akili? Aye. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you, Ms. Bell. Brings us to item three on the agenda. It is an information item. Uh, the business plan, uh, and I know there's a, a, a PowerPoint that goes along with this. I'll turn it over to our Chief Executive Officer, Ms. Lichnock. Cassandra? Good morning. Thank you, Chair Keeley. Um, I'll wait for the PowerPoint to uh, start lo loading. And this is really just a discussion of our annual business plan um, for this coming year that we uh, that is prepared as part of the three-year strategic plan cycle that we have are currently within. Uh, you can go on to the next slide, please. The current three-year strategic plan is running from 2019 through 2022. It's the last year of this cycle. The plan is a detailed roadmap of initiatives and supporting activities that articulate the practical and achievable steps that we intend to execute to accomplish the board's strategic plan goals and accompanying objectives. There are some pandemic related delays that we have occurred that have occurred this past year that have impacted our work, but we're committed to renew and reinforce our efforts on these initiatives to support and ensure the successful implementation of these critical endeavors. This year, our annual business plan continues to focus on the execution and strategy for achieving full funding. Next slide, please. The full funding uh, of the defined benefit program is slated to be accomplished by 2046. The plan is working and the defined benefit program is on target towards its full funding goal. We have developed several initiatives in this business plan to sustain the system's financial health. And in support of our work toward achieving the full funding, the business plan includes multiple efforts and activities throughout the organization to support full implementation of CalSTRS collaborative model. This includes initiatives that will drive operational changes to recruitment, procurement, and travel processes and policies, as well as implement the investment analytics systems. So these combined uh, changes to our operational structures and policies paved the way for us to realize expanded cost savings, further control risks, and increase operational efficiencies to develop a new pipeline for opportunities for the investment branch. Next slide. In addition to those efforts, we're focused on advancing the work and successfully implementing the Pension Administration System Benefit Connect and the headquarters expansion project. Uh, we will be talking a little bit more, well, quite a bit more about both of those projects later on in today's uh, agenda items. Next slide. But the way we work continues to transform and change and we continue to advance plans to reopen our headquarters and member service centers and adapt to new blended work environments. The new business plan includes initiatives to support uh, strengthening our resiliency as an organization and as a dedicated workforce. It's important that we thoroughly assess the impact of reopening the offices on our staff, our operations, and uh, most importantly, how we service our members. So we're looking at all of the things that we've learned from this past 18, 16 to 18 months um, about how we can improve from those things that we've learned moving forward into our future state as we transition back. Change management and communication strategies are being developed and we're designing work structures and tools necessary to fully support a blended workforce. Next slide. So you may have noticed several new efforts in this plan and I'd like to highlight a few. Um, one, we've advanced efforts on the focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And although we're on the right path with the accomplishments in this area, you heard about quite a bit of those uh, yesterday in the investment committee, but we realize there's a lot of uh, growth still um, in this area and opportunities for process improvements to pursue. So our new business plan lists um, multiple activities to support integrating diversity, equity, and inclusion into all of our CalSTRS practices. Next slide. Another multi-year effort that we're gonna be initiating this fiscal year is the formation of a customer experience management program that when fully established will improve member and employer engagement and satisfaction and reduce member effort. We will uh, encourage the growth of confidence in our retirees by continuing our work on stabilizing the benefit through fully developing the employer reporting to final benefit project as a vehicle to address complex issues, increase reporting accuracy and enhance benefit stabilization. Uh, next slide. And finally, I'd like to highlight the work that we intend to do in the important area of sustainability. 
We will define a path to unify our enterprise investment sustainability programs and develop a five-year plan for advancing CalSTRS corporate sustainability program as a leader. This is another area where we have performed important foundational work, and now's the time to expand our efforts and model the way as a premier sustainability organization. Next slide. The accomplishments of all of the uh, 2021 through 22 business plan initiatives and activities will have a positive impact on the long-term returns and the payment of benefits to our members. This intended work properly executed and implemented will increase our ability to respond to customer and business needs, enhance services to members, beneficiaries, staff and employers and improve internal controls. Executing the 21-22 business plan will move us closer to successfully accomplishing the overarching goals and objectives established in the board's strategic plan, which are right in the middle of renewing for the next three year strategic plan cycle, starting in the 22-23 fiscal year, moving through to 24-25. So with that, um, put up the final slide, we just offer some um, opportunities of, for questions by the board members, uh, executive staff, and other participants are here to answer any detailed questions on any part of the business plan. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Cassandra. We'll open it up to questions or comments from the board, if there are any. Seeing none, it's great. We'll, we will move to the next item, which is, so thank you for the report, Cassandra, which is uh, item four, which is the state and federal uh, legislation update. Joyce Lynn's with us today, and I know she has a the ledge matrix, which is uh, in our packet as well. Joyce Lynn, I'll turn it over to you. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Today, this is an informational item. There are no bills to take positions on today, and so it is an update on bills that have moved since we last met, and if you look at attachment one, I'll start at the top and just move through and briefly give an update on, again, bills that have moved since we last met. So AB 539, one of our sponsored bills on investment procurement, will be up in the Senate Appropriations Committee next week. We are continuing to engage with the Government Operations Agency and the Department of Finance as the bill moves forward. AB 845, moving down the list, it's awaiting a vote on the Senate floor. AB 890 is also awaiting a vote in the Senate Appropriations Committee next week. AJR 9 on the weapon GPO repeal, the resolution for that is awaiting a vote on the Senate floor. SB 294, removing the 12 year limit on service credit for elected officers is awaiting a vote on the assembly floor. SB 457 on uh, Turkish divestment for um, employers and the opportunity for them to select an ex Turkey portfolio that remains in the assembly policy committee. And with the help of several stakeholder groups, member and employer groups, CalRTA, CSESA and many others, um, we found success in stopping the bill from being set for a hearing in that assembly policy committee. So it's not moving forward at this time. And we'll give you any updates in the future if that changes. And then last but not least, SB 634, which is our sponsored housekeeping bill that's awaiting a vote on the assembly floor. And I'm here for any questions you might have. Thanks, Joyce Lynn. I don't see any hands. I appreciate the update on the report and the matrix. Thank you very much. Moving right along. The speed at which we're moving is making me nervous. <laughs> Somewhere we're gonna get talkative. I think it might be today, right now. Item number five, which brings us to the pension solution update. I know we have staff, uh, Prashant is with us as well as Graham Finley. I don't know if Graham, I know Graham is here. Uh, Graham, why don't you just jump on the screen now as well? Yep. And we've received your communication. So Prashant, uh, update on the Pension Solution Project, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to provide an update for the project. Our board report has details, so I will keep my update brief in order to leave more time for discussions or answering any questions that you may have. So last time I mentioned that the schedule review is underway to address some of the challenges we are faced with. So today I'm going to start with an update to the most pressing matter, which is schedule replanning. About two weeks back, CGI provided a high level draft schedule indicating a potential shift of 18 to 24 months to our planned FR2 and FR3, functional rollout two and functional rollout three go live dates. 
I also want to mention that this schedule is not just about how long it will take for us to finish the remaining task that we have, but it also anticipate some additional capacity that we may need to we may need to use it to support some additional functionality that may come our way in the near future. For example, there are some tax changes that uh, that have come our way in last uh, two years, and it may come again. We have also focused on strengthening our security posture from the application perspective to keep keep up with the need of time. So this schedule is not just about how long it will take for us to finish the task that we have at hand. It also anticipates some additional capacity that we may need to uh, entertain some of the dynamic business uh, we are working with. So currently, we, along with the oversight consultants, are working together to carefully review the high-level draft schedule details to ensure impacts to the business operations are accounted for, and if needed, find ways to further reduce the risk and impact to the business operations. Once that is done, the project will follow the change request process to finalize and formalize their wise schedule. At this point, we expect to present the finalized schedule and make recommendation in September timeframe. Now, let me highlight some of the project progress and I will start with the employee readiness. So the employee readiness team has made great progress up to this point. All the 92 reporting sources are now equipped to test and get ready towards the new system. A dedicated and focused team continues to be engaged with our employer community for any support they may need to get ready. I also want to mention that most of the training courses and job aids are now available to all our reporting sources and employers, which will provide them education on how to report using the new system. And as mentioned last time, any extension to the function rollout to go live date will provide additional time for our employers to transition to the new system and adopt to the new file format. Now, data conversion, training, and change management teams continues to make great progress. Regarding the testing effort in function rollout two, contractor acceptance testing, we call it CAT, is progressing, but certainly at a much slower pace than what we planned for given various challenges that uh, I have shared in the past board meetings. And there are many type of test activities, probably a little over 10, that CGI is either currently performing or they are supporting. They have recently completed one of the test activity, we call it system testing, and they are working through others to complete it. Calisters continue to make progress on UAT, but at a slower pace than planned due to various reasons, such as high number of problem incident report, also known as PIR, than, than what we expected. This adds to the unplanned workload for both Calisters as well as for CGI. At this point, about 46% of all the UAT test cases have been executed, and about 35% of, of all the UAT test cases have passed. Once the UAT test cases are executed and passed 100%, then regression testing phase will kick in to ensure system quality one last time before we go live. As far as function rollout three effort goes, as we reported in the previous update, CGI has redirected their FR3 resources to support FR2 CAD delays, which essentially paused FR3 progress. However, as CGI is able to make further progress in the FR2 CAD activities, they have started to resume some of those FR3 activities at this point. Now, while we have been able to make progress in various areas and determining a more realistic schedule. We also continue to work with CGI to address various challenges. Our report has more details, but I would like to highlight three today. The first one is around testing challenge. As mentioned before, testing progress is slower than expected for various reasons. And this high level draft schedule that CGI has provided incorporates some of the lesson learned that we, have, we had from the past to be more realistic. The second is about CGI resource challenges. We, along with oversight consultants, are actively engaged and looking to CGI to overcome some of the staffing issues quickly and effectively. This is a key to ensure that the proposed schedule remain, remains viable. And the third one is the COVID. 
situation. The project team still continues to operate almost 100% remote for the last 16 months. And as situation is improving, we are certainly looking for to identify opportunities where we may be able to gain some efficiencies from the physical work environment perspective. We have already identified a big conference room in our headquarter building that can house about 45 team members in, in one place with a proper social distance and all those um, safety guidelines. We just need to take care, take into consideration various aspects before we could make final plans uh, to be able to use some of those facilities. As a matter of fact, a couple of team members have already started using that space uh, for a few days a week. Uh, in our building headquarters. It goes without saying that Pension Solution Project is one of the largest, most complex transformation project at Calisters, given its size, complexity, and the dynamics it comes with, as well as the importance and the value it carries for the Calisters future operations. And my sincere appreciation goes to hundreds of the project team members and the subject matter experts across the organization who continue to work very, very hard and make progress despite various challenges we have faced in the last 16 months while working remotely. And of course, to our executive leadership team and to board for their understanding and support uh, in this project. We know challenges are part and parcel of such large and complex project and our ability to stay persistent and focused while ensuring we find the best possible solutions to, to mitigate these challenges remains the key and we as a team remains committed to that. That's all I had. I will now invite Graham for to share any additional perspective from his independent uh, oversight. I, I see a couple of board members' hands. If you would, wouldn't mind, uh, I'd prefer to hear from uh, Mr. Finley first and then we'll take questions and comments from the board. So Graham, let me turn it over to you for your, your general comments, please. Okay, thank you. Um, I think there are really two points I would make following up on um, what Prashanda said. The first being around the, you know, the duration of the delay. So the, you know, the um, 18 to 24 months, the one factor to bear in mind is uh, that's, a, that's a result of bookending all of the activities that are needed in order to complete testing and get ready for go live together with uh, sort of the, the new durations that have been revised based on the experience over the last six months in particular. But that doesn't, that doesn't translate into an implementation date. You can't simply sort of add that date to where we are today because of operational impacts. Plus there are a series of conversations that have started around potential opportunities to you know, think differently around implementation strategies uh, and how that might make, you know, make an impact. So, um, you know, we've got to be cautious about projecting, you know, a date directly um, out of that delay. And I know that's something that, you know, Prashant and the team are going to be working closely with CGI over the next couple of months ahead of the September board meeting to try and nail down. The second piece, um, I think, goes to sort of uncertainty and sort of level of confidence and so on. I would say we have um, a reasonably high level of confidence in the estimate that's being put forward based on the information that is known and the, the, the workload that is understood. The advantage that the team has now compared to the estimation activities that went on probably six months ago is that we're almost 50% of the way through execution of UAT and the lessons out of that have been taken into consideration. So we feel that the, you know, the level of detail associated with the modeling and the projection is pretty solid to the extent that we know the full scope, right? The, the level, the, the uncertain area still is what happens with anything around design changes that may come up in the remaining half of uh, the UAT execution. Because that, again, that's new work that may not be fully um, anticipated. It should be noted that there are a couple of buckets of um, contingency areas for, for, for design changes to go into the schedule that's already been modeled into that timeline. So there is an expectation of a certain amount of that work coming in and that's already been factored into. But again, it's just an estimate of how much of that is going to come. And so that to us is probably the, the biggest area of uncertainty still remaining. So I'll pause there. Thank you, Graham. The um, members of the board who have questions or comments in the order that they appear uh, are Bill, Sharon, and then Betty. 
And I would just ask my colleagues, once you complete your questions and you want to yield the floor, just mention that you're complete, you're done, and then the next person can pick up. So it will be Bill, Sharon, and then uh, Controller Yee. Mutes off. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Rashant, for that uh, presentation. And also thank you for uh, providing us with a written uh, response to questions that have been raised previously uh, by other members of the board. Um, you know, I, I must admit that uh, I've only begun to really focus uh, uh, attentively, uh, as, as attentively as I, I feel is necessary uh, on this particular item because, the, you know, refresh my recollection, this, this, what's the total contract cost here? Uh, it's around three hundred four million dollars. Okay, so you know that's that's obviously uh, real money, and we've been on track for uh, you know a fairly steady time. You know the the reports have been encouraging, and in the last six months, we've we've noticed that that there's been some faltering here uh, in the testing process, and and we've got some issues. I guess my concern is this 18 to 24 month projection. I, Graham, I understand it's not an assurance, it's a projection. Uh, and the cost that that will have, uh, you know, to CalSTRS. Um, and there are certain comments made in your written uh, response to questions that gave me some pause. Uh, one on page four was uh, CalSTRS and project oversight consultants remain concerned with CGI's resource challenges and their capacity slash ability to resolve PIRs timely to meet the project requirements and timeliness. Uh, CalSTRS and project oversight consultants continue to follow up with CGI to address those challenges. Uh, that is a concern to me. Uh, you know, the cost that any cost, additional cost here has to be measured in terms of, you know, what is the causation uh, for these potential change orders? And I just would hope that we're uh, conferring with experts uh, in terms of the contract to ensure that our exposure here, given the hard work that I know that you, Pashan, and your staff, and uh, all of those at CalSTRS have put into this project, I hope we're getting uh, some advice on, on the contract and, and certain exposure uh, that might be incurred in the, in the faulty uh, uh, you know, results that we've had in the last few months. Uh, and, and can you assure me that you're getting some advice? Yes, uh, yes, your point is well taken. Yes, we are, we, we are certainly taking advices from various uh, parties we have uh, inside Calisters as well as some of them outside Calisters to best of our ability. So yes, we are, not, we are also not taking this lightly because it's a, it's a big shift. It, it, we know that uh, shift essentially means that there is an impact on the, finish, uh, on the finance as well. So yes, we are doing certainly best possible within organization and also taking the advices from outside organization on various matters as we finalize the schedule, as we finalize some of the uh, some of the movements here, including leveraging the oversight consultants who are independently working and reviewing these activities to ensure that that those the plans that we make remains viable, they are practical and they are they are achievable. And and I think it is uh, significant enough uh, that we have some interim reports, uh, you know, you know, in some fashion uh, between now and the September meeting. We don't want to be presented with a fait accompli at the September meeting. I, I don't. I mean, I'm just speaking for myself. I don't want to have, oh, yes, we've agreed to X uh, and we're moving forward. I think that any any because of the significant cost in, involved here. I think that the, the board has, um, I, would, I would suggest the board has some responsibility to make sure that we're, uh, we're proceeding in a responsible way. I, I expect we will be, but I also know that our oversight on this particular issue is pretty acute, given the fact that this is one of the three major issues that we have uh, facing us uh, as, a, as a, an institution and therefore as a board. 
Thank you. Yep. And, and one Sean, last thing. Before, uh, before you respond, I saw that Ms. Licknock had her hand up. So let me acknowledge our CEO. Cassandra? Thank you, Chair Keeley. I just wanted to clarify, my not, I think it's important that the contract is not 304 million. The contract is 170 million, just a little over 170 million with CGI. Our overall budget was 304. And that the other part of that is our internal costs associated with that and other vendor relationships that we have. So it is a big contract, but it's not that $304 million. But any, any decisions that will be made on a budget or and schedule will be made by the board. This is under your governance and we will be uh, doing our due diligence to provide you all of the information that you will be able to, um, you know, contemplate to make that decision on how we move forward and the costs associated with that. So we'll absolutely be working with you and providing you all the information that you need to make that make those decisions. Great, thank you very much, Cassandra. Okay, we're gonna go to Sharon and then controller Yi, and after the controller, Ms. Erden and then Ms. Higa. Sharon? Um, and, and Prashant, I do just, it's it's been a, a long time with COVID and I do, I do just wanna make sure the staff hears our gratefulness from the board. I know, I know I'm tired of Zoom. I can't imagine working on this project for the years and years that your team has been working on it. And so I just wanna extend Thanks to all of you out there that are watching us um, and working so hard on this project. It's like a marathon. I've run a half marathon one time. I don't know if I'll ever do it again. It's hard to do these long-term projects. And so thanks to the staff for their hard work on that. And, and I'm looking forward to getting that finish line soon. Um, a couple questions and, and Graham, I would appreciate your insight into this since I know you provide consulting services to other funds that are looking at some of these projects. Um, with the potential time delay, and my understanding is we'll hear from, you know, in your write-up, Graham, to us, you know, that we'll hear more specifics on cost and timeline pieces with, from the project um, team in September. And to Bill's point, if there's anything that happens before that, would be great for us to hear, obviously. But I'm just kind of, I've been thinking a lot about these long-term projects and thinking about the speed in which IT is changing in the world and thinking, you um, how how do, how do you think about a project like this that takes six to eight years potentially or, or longer? Um, and then when it's completed, the potential now with kind of the speed of, of change, right? And, and everything that's going on with AI, it just blows my mind what I can do on my, my phone these days. Um, how do you think about that from kind of a, a big picture level in terms of the time and energy it takes to complete these um, projects and then obviously, you know, it's done and then we might find ourselves with new problems to solve, I guess, in terms of some of the things, you know, I've been thinking about with FinTech and, you know, using our phone with our members more in terms of reaching out to them and, and member benefits and things like that. So can you talk about I, that a little bit in terms of if the project, you know, does continue to get delayed? How are you thinking about that? How are you advising the team? And I, I guess maybe how is the, the team thinking about that as well? So I don't know, Graham, if you want to go first and then Ashish or. So I can go first. I mean, it's it's a big question. Um, <laughs> and so it's I'm trying to sort of think of a concise way of addressing it. Right. So I think there's there's a couple of things. Um, one being, I, I think, an advantage of the you know, one of the elements of the, the, the solution is it, it's built upon a framework, a technology framework and the Sagitech solution that is designed for pension systems and is, you know, evolving with pension systems. So the idea of being it's not, it's not something that's going to become quote unquote legacy technology, you know, anytime soon, right? And I think Ashish, you know, maybe can address that a little bit more from a, you know, technology foundation perspective, but that builds in a little bit of, you know, um, sort of future proofing if you like, around the platform and sort of being de dedicated to this business for the long term. There is a broader question about how you address these very large, you know, multi-year, multi, you know, $100 million engagements. And there is sort of a new, you know, people are starting to think about these things a little differently, right? Um, just nationally. Um, I, and I think there's a, 
the way that the, the pension solution um, you know, project is starting to, to sort of adopt that in a way if there's a, a, a more of a, a concept around product management versus project management. So if you think about, and often people think about the iPhone as sort of a, an analogy, right? It's not sort of a, a thing that gets built and then you sit it on the shelf and then you, you know, it never changes, but you basically create an instance of it that's usable and then it, it evolves over time. And it's something that goes through a sort of an improvement and a maturation in a series of cycles. The length of time to get to that first, you know, viable product is obviously very, very long in this case. But there, I think, and Prashant can talk to this, there's already, you know, concepts for things that would beyond, be beyond the first implementation for enhancements and improvements, that this is not a solution that's going to be created and then be a static thing that then basically has to be replaced in 10 years, right, as another legacy. It's meant to be something that evolves over time. And then, you know, every six months or however long, there's going to be enhancements and both the functionality and the technology foundation will, will, you know, will morph and evolve over time. And that's sort of the plan, you know. I think the length of this particular project is sort of an example, I think, of, you know, there's a, there's a generation, you know, of these type of projects that we've all seen, whether within the state or just, you know, with, with large government and private sector entities, people are looking to move to a sort of smaller, more incremental uh, type of deployments. And I think that's sort of the future of a pension solution, too, is once, you know, you get over this, this initial implementation, that you're going to see this evolving over time. And it's going to be, you know, the, the, the project will stop, but the product management will never stop because it's always going to be evolving. So with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to Sean. So I think I just will add a little bit. I think Graham said it all about the legacy project, but um, Sharon and the board, we changed our posture for the last couple of years. You know, we are doing a business transformation, digital transformation. We came up with the agile kind of mindset and we changed that one. And I think when you're seeing this new timeline, we are adding some lesson learned and then putting in there also. So. You didn't hear about, we have a Concord implementation recently. We are moving into the BIDW space, but we are not just doing like a cookie cutter kind of a big project with the five-year plan or something. We are just going just a piecemeal kind of six month at a time, POC, get it done quickly, get the value out of it. What is ROI we are getting out of it? And then moving forward with the big implementation. So there is a lot of change happening just like in the last three to five years in the technology area. And we are reacting to that one. We are not proactively now working to make it that one is the part of our DNA. That's helpful, Shish. And, and Mr. Chair, I'll just, a couple of things you said that are helpful for me. And I, I uh, is it's moving to product management, not project management, uh, not static. It evolves over time, nimble, agile. Um, that gives me, you know, some some comfort because I, I I do think things are changing so quickly, and so um, you know we'd hate to have this project done and then you know have it be a legacy. So I appreciate the assurances. Thanks, Ashish and Graham. Thank you, Ms. Hendricks. Controller Yi. Um, thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Harry. Um, uh, I guess I've been waiting for this point in time with respect to this project, just to kind of get a grip on uh, just where exactly we are. Um, and it's um, just difficult to do oversight when there have been, um, you know, a number of factors that have influenced the schedule. And I know that we had um, made a commitment to really adhere to, um, you know, quality um, over time. And so, um, I, I think uh, that still is something that we definitely want to uh, be sure we are uh, committed to. But um, this is a this is a pretty large delay for this for a project of the size. I mean, I'm involved with some statewide projects and we have delays, but this is a huge delay. And I guess I'm worried about a couple things. One is, um, <clears throat> and I guess not so much worry because we're having the conversation, but I really do want this board to have um, steady oversight from this point forward over the project. Um, and a lot of it just speaks to um, <clears throat> how we're gonna really continue to uh, maintain um, our uh, employers' trust and confidence in the project um, as we see these delays and, and adjustments that will need to be made going forward. So um, and I, the only way I can think about how to do that is transparency. Um, and so I'd like to ask that uh, for the next report in the fall, 
if we could maybe have a level set and just get some of the original, um, you know, kind of documents about the original time frame for the project um, costs. Um, at what point we had staffing changes, um, and uh, I think you've been reporting all of those to us um, periodically, but. Uh, just to have it all in one place so that as we move forward, we know um, whether we've been down that road before and we can do our due diligence as a board around uh, why we're taking the steps that uh, are being um, suggested. And then um, my question really uh, speaks to, uh, actually, let me comment on Sharon's question because um, you know, these projects support a business. And uh, even though technology is changing, um, the business isn't changing a lot. And so um, I think uh, we just have to remember that. And so um, I got a little skeptical with some of these new approaches because uh, at the end of the day, they're not really, really being responsive to the business to be delivered. So I think we just wanna be um, a little bit more circumspect about you know, just some of those uh, offerings that are out there. Um, but my question really speaks to um, how have we been keeping the employers informed to date around, you know, just the status of the project. And because um, I, I do think the um, the bigger issue, I mean, we're going to deal with the, uh, the costs, we're going to deal with the time delay, uh, but I don't know how you put a value around um, employers' trust and confidence in the project. Yeah, uh, sure. Um, um, so my understanding is that we are, certainly keeping the employers updated about the potential delay. As a matter of fact, we have communicated to them that we will not be able to meet our planned go live date. So they are well aware of that adjustment. And just yesterday, we are also working on a, another round of communication with the employers to communicate the potential adjustment in the schedule we are looking for so that they are well aware of what adjustments are ahead of us so that they can plan. So I, I would say, without any doubt that we are certainly keeping employer community informed about any adjustment, even though it's not final, but we are keeping them informed about what's ahead of us as we finalize the new adjustments. Okay, great, <clears throat> thank you. Um, you know, at some point, and I know Ram's aware of this because I've seen so much of uh, Ram Thornton's uh, work in this uh, arena, which I think is always very helpful, but. Um, when the project is said and done, when we go back and actually look at the um, uh, evaluate, uh, evaluate and review the project, um, aside from uh, just uh, looking at the product itself and, and certainly um, just the overall project, um, I, I would like to kind of um, have us explore um, kind of the process. Um, I don't know what was employed at the beginning of this project with respect to uh, getting vendors in to have a good sense of what they were going to be embarking upon. I know that's been a little bit more of a common um, occurrence where um, there is the ability to have uh, vendor meetings, um, potential vendor meetings up front. Um, and whether it happened for this project, I don't know. Um, but I would like to have some um, treatment of uh, just, and, and maybe this is part of the report in the fall as well as just, you know, the the uh, engagement with vendors leading up to, to the um, awarding of the project. Yeah, we definitely will provide Betty. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Controller Yee. Uh, Jennifer Erden and then uh, Joy Giga. Thank you, Harry. And I'll add my thanks and gratitude to our, to our staff. Um, I had a couple of questions now, I guess, is the second newest board member. Um, this may have been done, but at least in my experience, a project of this scale, you can only base, and as was referenced, our estimates on timing and cost based on experience and then the data and information available at the time. And the vendors need to coordinate um, together with us. And so I would just find it useful if it hasn't been done already, that as we are going across milestones where um, you know more information is known to be able to better calibrate and create a tighter probability around time and cost or where the issues might be that we have a sense of that because it, we've progressed through a number of stages and maybe we're now at that stage where we have a much tighter range of outcomes but understanding that helps, at least in my case, it helps me understand um, how to interpret the plans that we're seeing going forward. Um, secondly is, you know, with CGI, with our vendors, it has been a long time that we've been working together. So just ensuring, as I'm sure you are, that we have the highest time and attention 
that we know how to calibrate what they're telling us, that all the roles and responsibilities and the handoff points are tight and well understood by the people who are on it on a day-to-day -day basis um, would be terrific just to confirm that that's intact. And then given the long delay with the true north on quality that you will come to us if um, there are some of these trade-offs in agility, but with the mindset to quality and the business that we're serving, if you have recommendations for us to consider. Yep. Uh, thank you, Ms. Odin. Yes, I think your points are well taken. And on the first point about, uh, about the, the uh, using experience to come up with a schedule. So what you said is absolutely true that uh, the schedule was derived based on the uh, vendor experience uh, and our experience as well. And, and the, it worked out that the plan or the assumptions we made didn't, didn't work out to be the true. So now the new schedule that we have arrived at certainly use the, the very real experience that we have faced in this project itself. And hence we have a better confidence that the schedule that we have is certainly more viable than, than ever at this point of time. So there is a better confidence given we are using the data that we are seeing on the ground as against our industry-based best practices assumptions, which sometimes do not work uh, as we want them to work. And, and, to your, and to the second point around uh, following up with CGI leadership. So, so rest assured, I think we are very actively engaged with CGI leadership at every level at this point of time to make sure we have their highest attention. I mean, this is not a, a small delay. I think we all recognize certainly it's a big, big shift you're talking about here. And, and we are looking forward to get this right by making sure we have the highest level attention. So rest assured, we are talking to CGI at every level at this point of time. And to your last point about quality, this schedule do not, is making sure that the quality goal that we started with, that remains our this exact same goal, if not better, about the quality. So we are not compromising with the quality at all. This delay essentially is ensuring that whatever goals we have to begin with, those goals are met even if we have to put more money uh, and more time into the project. So yes, on all those three points, I appreciate you, you saying it, it is, it is very well taken and, and that's how we are op operating for this project as well. Thank you. And then one quick question, um, in terms of meeting the quality and doing the, you know, the getting the right balance in terms of quality and cost and time, um, if it, results in a higher customization services component. And I don't know if it does, but if it does, um, do we have the right talent available to us and capacity of the talent needed if there was a shift in that area to meet our objectives? Yeah, so at this point of time, um, just at a high level. Um, just at a high level is great, thank you. <laughs> I, mean, I would say uh, we have about 25% customization and 75% is out of box functionality. So the level of customization is quite manageable. And this, this shift is likely not going to change the equation way too much. 25% may increase by a few percent here and there, but we are still at the same level where we expect it to be when we started this project. Terrific. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you. you again for all your great work. Thank you. Jennifer, Joy. Thank you very much. And um, uh, Prashant and Ashish and Graham, thank you for the update. And I also just want to um, lend my appreciation um, or to the comments made by other board members um, for all that you're doing and in, in your staff. Um, just give it, given a challenging time. I know like the rest of us, you want to see us make forward progress at a high quality and it's frustrating. I think uh, for all of us when we're, we're not hitting the marks that we set. Um, you know, so this is sort of the second, I think, big reset that we're doing in the project. I think it was back in 2018 or 2019 when, um, you know, there was a lot of discussion with our vendors about reevaluating um, the, the timeframes, the expectations and, and the contract. Um, we're we're going to have to do that again. And I think, um, you know, while we, we talk about in this discussion and we've talked before about our focus on quality and not sacrificing quality, um, you know, it's, it's sort of um, 
underestimating, if I understand it, you know, the the, the sort of error rate um, or, or defect rate that has leads us to this position. Um, you know, we underestimated the, the defect rate, which means that we have to spend more time on testing, which means we have to utilize more of those, you know, more resources that are not available now for other components of the project. So as we as as we go back to you know to continue discussions with CGI, look at the schedule they've put together. Um, it, it, how are we trying to, you know, um, stress test even more um, the the assumptions that are being made about about quality and about the ability to kind of deliver quality on the schedule that we're talking about? Um, because it's the schedule it seems is only as good as what the technology that and and that we're able to deliver or that our vendor is able to deliver. Um, and if we are uh, don't have as much confidence in that, how can we have confidence on everything else that we're building into the schedule or the, the resources or the budget? Sure. Uh, uh, so, so when we say quality, I think um, quality for us essentially means that we are finding more defects than what we anticipated and which is why uh, we are concerned about quality. Now, now there are two ways to manage it or, or there are thirdly two ways to manage it. One is the, the quality that is coming in for the UAT is higher, higher quality. And so we have to spend less time in finishing our UAT. But the second option is that, that we assume that we are going to have higher failure rate in UAT and then add more time to the schedule. Because in the end, we, we will need to be almost 100% pass with every test case before we can go live. So our goal, when we say that our, our quality goal has not changed, what essentially means is that we are looking for to ensure that our UAT test cases that we have in about 6,800, 900 test cases, they all must pass before we go live. So that's the quality goal that we are still, uh, still very much looking for to achieve it. Now, how we get there uh, is, is what is being uh, incorporated part of this revised schedule where we are assuming we are going to face more uh, defects or more PIRs in this process, and hence we should plan additional time to it. So, and, and I don't. Sorry, Prashant, I'm sorry. Can, can I just ask a question though? I think um, do we do do we know? And and if if I'm not asking the right question, then you know, then let me know or Graham put you know put me on the right track. But do we understand why we're getting more defects? Um, as we're as we're doing the testing, I understand that we can we have some um, flexibility in where we set our tolerance for defects that we're willing to accept. But if we're getting more defects, is is it, how is you know is is it possible to address that with CGI in terms of why more defects are coming in than we had anticipated or planned for? So I, I wouldn't mind taking a. Mm -hmm a crack at explaining this because I think part of the challenge is it's trying to get a little bit sort of beyond the numbers and understanding sort of the terms um, and trying to just dis distinguish between what appears to be a quality issue versus what is really a schedule issue and a sort of a level of effort issue right and and one of the one of the challenges we have and it's you know it's a, it's 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 a, a normal sort of part of the testing process, but it can be a little confusing um, if you're sort of, sort of new to the, the sausage making, if you like. But the, we're referring to these um, terms of problem incident reports, PIRs, right? Those are the things when people are executing a test, they find something that appears not to be correct versus what is documented should happen. And so they raise it and that's a PIR. And there's a lot of those and a lot more than perhaps we were expecting. But because you've got a PAR, it does not automatically mean you have a defect in the software. Because there's a whole process that's happening, it's called the triage process, that investigates that with CalSTRS and CGI sitting down, okay, well, why exactly did this tester find a result that wasn't what we were expecting and what exactly is it? And as it turns out, there's a, a quite a significant number of those PARs that are identified turn out not to be defects in the software at all. And it's not actually something that needs to be fixed. It could, there's a whole range of different things. It could be data issues, could be interpretation issues. Maybe it's a problem in the design, design has to change. There's a lot of, lot of things that, that might happen, but it's all work, right? And so if you imagine all of the work that goes from those PIRs that 
involve, you know, you can have half a dozen people involved in these conversations and the end result is, well, we don't actually need to change the software. So it wasn't a qualities question at all, but it, it's, a, it's eaten up a lot of people's time, right? So that, that is, a, it's not all, but like it's, it, that's an element, right? A part of what I call the friction in the testing process. And there's a lot more of that than anybody was anticipating. I think people were expecting the testing process to be a lot cleaner than it's turned out to be. Similarly, the actual logistics of executing some of these tests has proven to be enormously complex in terms of setting up the data and then you know, running a set of tests and then realizing there's some kind of issue that has to be resolved and then resetting the data and running it again. Again, it's turned out to be significantly more, um, it's more complicated. So that, that's a lot of what's been leading into the workload. It's not to say there hasn't been more actual genuine defects than we've expected, but that's not the whole story. A lot of what's been driving the schedule is all of this other stuff. You know, and while, you know, COVID isn't the reason we're having this issue, we would be in this, like a similar sort of situation, even if COVID had never happened, COVID made it worse because people weren't able to sit down together and it's just added more friction, which has just slowed things down. So that's all sort of part of it. And so it's, it's a little bit of a complicated process, which is why the answer about why are we here isn't clean and simple. It's because the causes aren't really clean and simple as well. So I don't know how helpful that is, but that's sort of how we see the, the situation. I, I actually I appreciated that and I found it helpful because one of my concerns had been if we are sort of doing a reset and you know re looking again at our schedule and the budget and the resources, I was concerned about um, our ability to rely on what we're getting from our vendor to to um, as the baseline for making some of those decisions. That's still a component of it, it sounds like, but uh, there are other elements that are not solely with the software itself, but that are part of the overall process that um, it, it sounds like we are, we're, I guess we're you know, learning from and are going to fold that into trying to drive to better, more accurate estimates of schedule and resources and, uh, um, and, and staff to work. I think that's fair. And what I would actually hope that we can do in the September meeting is, to the extent it's possible to do this in a way that doesn't overly complicate things is to disaggregate some of this. So we can mm -hmm. sort of show, you know, what is really around like true defects versus just work that's been created for the testing teams by all of this other stuff that goes around it. And, and you know, just unpack some of that just so you have a little bit more visibility because I think that'll help um, inform the degree of confidence you should have in the projections going forward. Because part of, you know, what gives us at least a, a reasonable degree of confidence about the projections that are going, you know, that, that are happening for this, you know, this new schedule, it's assuming essentially that same degree of friction going forward, mm -hmm. right? But we do think there are actually opportunities to reduce it, whether it be just improving the processes, maybe getting people together in person in some, to some degree. There are some of those opportunities, we think. Um, but the project has been, you know, relatively conservative in the projections it's making going forward. So you know, I think to the extent that we can explain that maybe in a, a cleaner way, um, that would be helpful. It's just, it's just unfortunately one of those situations that as soon as you get below surface level, it gets very complicated and it can get very confusing to explain. Um, I, I, so I would encourage us as we look forward at either at September or at subsequent um, checkpoints or, or with some of the interim reporting that some of the committee members have talked about, um, to, to try to to try to break it out in that way because um, I, I your explanation Graham just now was helpful helpful to me and um, you know I had thought that when we did um, you know our sort of first change and sort of initial major change in schedule and negotiation with CGI that um, it seemed as though we had really kicked the tires um, and I'm sure we did um, but as you say there are some other elements that maybe Ron anticipated. So, um, you know, I, I would find that, um, and maybe other board members would find that helpful just to make that kind of information available and try to pull apart um, as best we can what's, um, you know, kind of a complicated set of factors contributing to where we are. Thank you, Harry. Joy. Seeing no other hands, a um, couple of summaries as they go through the alley to pick up the garbage on 12th Street in Santa Monica. Um, one is uh, eController Yee has requested a single document that we can all 
look at in terms of essentially the history of this project and all the important decisions that we've made along the way. Uh, Bill uh, inquired about the causation and being assured that we're receiving advice from others around causations to the delay, and we've been assured of that. In response to some of those questions, we've also been assured that our oversight around budget is our decision, and at any point uh, that uh, amendments and changes need to be made, the board will be provided with the information that's required to make those decisions. Um, I think there were this continued focus on quality, uh, but also balancing, as uh, Jennifer so eloquently spoke about, balancing quality, time, and dollars, and how do we do that? I think Joy's last comments were centered around breaking down some of these complex issues, uh, and, and to the extent doing them in smaller chunks that simplify it would be helpful going forward. Uh, and then finally, Graham's comments around, um, we would be in this situation regardless of COVID, but COVID has made it more, has made it worse, I think was your comment. Um, and finally, our continued appreciation and gratitude to the staff that's overseeing this material project and significant uh, transformation that's uh, in years in ongoing uh, under stressful times we appreciate your efforts and work, uh, but the board is um, has a heightened level of awareness around the risks associated with this project, not the least of which are dollars and time. So we will continue to look for the updates, and I hope I uh, reflected everyone's comments uh, well, that uh, they're reflected in the minutes and in the reports coming forward. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to our CEO's report, um, which is item six. Cassandra, there you are. Good afternoon, or still good morning, I guess. Um, well, I'm excited to present my the CEO report as a CEO for the first time. And um, there's just a couple of things that I wanted to highlight in this report that I think are important. Um, I'm going to share some of the uh, spotlight, though. I'm going to have Lisa do the second half of this, and I'm just going to do the first half. Uh, the, the thing that I wanted to highlight up front was the Path Forward update and the work that we're continuing to do at monitoring and, um, and preparing for changing our work structure in the workplace and, and things that are going on in the organization. As you know, in June, there were a, a number of changes that occurred that allowed CalSTRS staff to modify how we work together. We're no longer required to wear masks if you're fully vaccinated in the building, and that was new, and that was something that was really um, a, a pivotal point for us to be able to really look forward to coming back into the office to any greater extent, since so much of our work is talking to not only one another and talking to our members and talking on the phone. Um, the masks, the mask wearing was really a deterrent for effective communication while in person, but I'm very happy that we're able to a move beyond that. Fully vaccinated um, employees that are do come into the office, they do have to provide an attestation that they've been vaccinated. We collect that and we um, um, hold that in a confidential manner through our human resources department. Unvaccinated employees uh, can continue to, they can come into the office, but they must continue to wear a face covering indoors. All of the physical distancing rules and capacity limits for elevators or training and conference rooms and restrooms are all restored to normal. So that is really helpful. Prashanta spoke about, um, you know, our, our testing uh, teams uh, coming back in and setting up the rooms in preparation for on-site uh, working arrangements for them. And the physical distancing was something that we really didn't know how that was going to play out in the long term. And it's, it's uh, really helpful now that we have some uh, breathability in being able to get back together and not have to be six feet apart um, when we're working together is very helpful. Visitors that come into the building or any of the public that comes into the building must wear a mask if they're not fully vaccinated and we have signage posted that provides those requirements. Um, if they are if they are fully vaccinated, they can come in without it, but that is their direction to them. We are not going to require an attestation or anything uh, such as that because that those are not um, staff under our control. We continue to move forward with plans to reopen the offices in September, and we're going to be phasing staff back with a measured and conservative approach. All of the temporary policies that we put in place in response to the pandemic emergency are now being modified to address 
longer term hybrid telework arrangements. So we're uh, currently reestablishing the building infrastructure for the return of staff working on site. During the pandemic, we've hired over 200 staff uh, in a remote setting. And, and now we need to go in and look at how we're gonna structure the, the building and where they're going to sit. Part of this as well, is when we were leaving the building, we were at capacity, we were bursting at the seams and trying to condense our space and, uh, and modify uh, things in a more compact, measured manner to keep everybody in the same headquarters building. Now we're going to be looking at, we're gonna be able to leverage people working in a hybrid uh, model to be able to make sure that we have the space that we need as we continue to grow and uh, transition into the headquarters expansion net once it gets uh, completed. And part of this is also reinforcing um, the redundancy that we need to create while we're working in a hybrid, hybrid model. If something changes in the environment, we want to be able to react um, in a more uh, measured manner rather than an emergency manner. So we will be making sure that we're building in those uh, redundancies. We want to make sure that we understand what office equipment needs um, are of staff, those that we need to duplicate, whether they're going to be in the physical headquarters uh, facility or in the home, their home office, and then identifying what parts or what equipment is transportable, such as a laptop, so we wouldn't need to du duplicate. So we're expecting this phased approach um, and the infrastructure preparedness to occur over approximately a three-month period of time uh, with a more stabilized state of the hybrid working arrangements by the end of the calendar year and, and probably moving into 2022. So those are the things that we're working on. Um, Currently, we're really focusing on communication change management, having staff be comfortable and confident that their um, health and well-being are at the uh, utmost priority for the organization, but also understanding that our, our need to be able to service our members, invest, and pay our benefits are um, one of the high, is the highest priority for us making these business decisions. And with that, I the other thing that we wanted to um, point out was the headquarters expansion project and the status of that and the status of our permit um, process. And Lisa's going to go through that unless you had any questions on the path forward piece. Okay. Oh, Karen? I don't know if I'm supposed to call. Yeah. <laughs> I'll recognize it. Sorry. Okay. All right. I just have one question. When you talk about um, staff returning to office, um, partially a few times a week or, or what, what, whatever that looks like, then the equipment, the hardware, the compute, the laptops will have to be in two different places. So, so is that, I mean, I'm sure you've thought about that, but I, I was just kind of thinking um, logistics. Um, how does that work? So if you're, if you're remote, you have to be remote. If you're, if you're going to go to the office, you, you do that and then you find some place that you can work while you're doing that. So it depends. It, it depends on the, the uh, schedule that staff are going to be um, working in. So if, if somebody is going to be working three or four days or even five days a week, they would have, a, you know, they would have their desktop or if they utilize a laptop, they would just, they would have a workstation dedicated to them and have their equipment there and they can keep everything there in their own, in their own setting. If it's somebody that's going to be working um, more at home or maybe it's split and they have a laptop, they can have a laptop. Most of our staff are working from laptops at work. If they're all working from laptops at home. And if they come in for a couple of days a week, then they would bring their laptop and plug it, just in it as though they were doing it at home. And if they don't have a dedicated workspace, we will have hoteling stations that they would be able to plug in, have their uh, work setting there for whatever period of time they're going to be there just as though they were um, working in a in their own office. Okay, and then those that staff that had chairs and, and those kinds of er ergonomic things that they've had at home, um, all those are gonna be worked out as well for, for the benefit of the employees, correct? We, we are, we're looking at all of those details. We haven't, we haven't landed on everything. Okay. Exactly, that's okay. why we're taking a, a you know, kind of a phased in transition. Most of the staff have taken their chairs home, but because of the reduction in um, conference room capacity, and we have those conference rooms packed with chairs because we were elbow to elbow, 
um, we've really redistributed re uh, the chairs that we had within the office in all of the different conference rooms to hopefully accommodate those that are coming in, you know, during this transition phase and then determine what office equipment we might need to um, add, add to our inventory to make sure that we have the redundancy and the duplicate um, equipment that we might need and, and chairs might be one of them. Um, monitors might be another thing. Cameras might be one of, one of the things that we might need to have duplicate um, equipment needs for. Okay. Thank you very much. And I, I didn't want to take. Thanks, Karen. I see uh, Sharon's hand. Thanks, Harry. Um, I just wanted to say, Cassandra, I really appreciate, I know Harry and I have been working really hard on agendas throughout the years um, and prioritizing. And I'm just glad that this is the number one thing on your report to us, because to me, the transition, I like the path forward too, because we're not going back to work or really kind of moving forward into a new reality. Um, and I know we're having these conversations with our, our campuses and our districts and our, our schools right now. Um, but I just want to you know, to me, as as board leadership, this this process and managing the path forward and, and managing the like you said, we've hired 200 plus staff, you know, via Zoom, and we have you know Blake joining us today, and the first time we meet him is on Zoom, which is lovely, but not anything like right. you know, um, you know, uh, Frank being able to make him a cappuccino in the back room before you know before the meeting or something like that. So I think managing this process because we have so much pride in our staff we have an incredible team um but as i've even seen just in my own life we all have different ways that we work from home we have different some of us have dogs some of us have kids some of us you know you've got lots of different factors going on for people taking care of elderly parents um, there's just a lot going on in people's lives and i think managing and figuring out how do we best um, prioritize the mission of CalSTRS, right, um, and our mission, while also just being thoughtful about staff transition back, to me really is, besides the funding plan, which is always, to me, number one in my mind, um, in the short run, this transition is, is key. So I'm just glad to see that as number one on your list. And it's certainly um, something that obviously we'll be be watching and, and uh, attentive to as we manage this process moving forward. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Um, Great. Lisa's going to take over the next spot. If, I just um, wanted to uh, just comment to Cassandra. Thank you and the team for your work when you're thinking about the, uh, the path forward. And so much of it is yet to be determined and it's unknown and it's going to change. Um, and I think there are a myriad of, as I mentioned yesterday, there are a myriad of risks associated with what the hybrid work environment might look like, some of which we know and others that we don't know. And um, certainly speaking for myself at this point, uh, and it's my view um, that simply because we can work from home doesn't mean we should work from home. Um, at the same time, technology has advanced so much that there are ways that we can use it. Uh, but at the end of the day, we are a people business. We're so proud of our culture. We're so proud of our facilities. We're so proud that uh, we're always recognized as one of the top places to work. Uh, I would hate to think in a couple of years back, a couple of years from now, we look back and say, boy, we made that decision to allow people to stay at home as frequently. And I know you're thinking about these things. I just wanted to, for myself, express that that's where I personally come down on it. Um, and at the same time, being open to where technology can be used uh, to make uh, CalSTRS an even more attractive place to work. But I would caution us of making permanent decisions based upon a, a pandemic. Um, because I always try to come from a place of we and not what's in the best interest of me, but what's in the best interest of our members and what's in the best interest of the collective CalSTRS. Uh, and uh, so something for us to all think about. So thanks for leading with that today. Thank you. Lisa, go ahead. I think Lisa, you're on mute still. Famous last words. 
Um, so from the beginning of the headquarters expansion project, we've identified authorities having jurisdiction over plan approvals, specifically the Office of the State Fire Marshal as a risk to our project, since we don't have control over their processes or resources. As a mitigation strategy, the architectural firm that was selected, ZGF, included a partnership with Lion Office, who's a local architect in Sacramento, who has extensive experience with the Office of the State Fire Marshal. The risk was labeled medium in the headquarters expansion portion of the CEO report from the inception of the project until November of 2020, at which time we upgraded the risk to high. This risk has now become an issue, delaying our schedule by more than five months and now impacting our ability to bring the project in within the $300 million budget. Bill Prezant and Sharon Hendricks serve as the board oversight of this project. And at the last monthly meeting, we all decided it was time to provide a more detailed picture of the time spent in plan check and permit issuance to the entire board. So I'd like to quickly go over the timeline. So to start, we've been in plan check for two and a half years. We submitted the phase one code analysis package, the very first permit request on 1-18-2019, and the permit was issued on July 18th, 2019. We submitted the phase two civil grading utilities and foundations package on July 23rd, 2019, and the permit was issued on October 9th, 2019. And at this point, we felt super positive that we were interpreting the code the same way and we were having very good communication between the teams. So we submitted the phase three structure package on October 18th, 2019, and the permit was issued on February 6, 2020. However, during this time frame, the previously approved phase one was revisited and that permit was required to be revised, requiring the project to add an additional fire booster pump. And this heightened our concern that new staff in the fire marshal's office were re-reviewing -re previously approved documents. So we held a meeting after receiving this third permit with the entire team, including the fire marshal, to ensure we understood the roles and responsibilities of the parties involved. It was identified that, that new eyes were on our plans. And on February 29th, 2020, we received a note from the supervising deputy who had provided the previous approvals stating that there was some misunderstanding of what had been previously approved, primarily the conference rooms on the bridge connecting the two buildings and associated exiting between the buildings and the design intent to treat both buildings as one large single building and changes would be required. So revisions were then required to all of the previously approved permits. And once, once that was completed, we submitted the final phase four architectural, electrical, plumbing and mechanical design package on April 1st, 2020. On July, 22nd, on July 22nd, 2020, we received a notice from the fire marshal that the entire permit package had been rejected after 16 weeks in review due to a variety of issues, many of which our design team disputed. So we scheduled a series of meetings between July and August to identify the key issues and establish a path forward. A new issue was then discussed related to the occupancy calculations and the fire marshal once again required revisions to our previously approved permits. The opinion of the fire marshal indicated that the occupancy would be above 5,000, which would require moving to the next higher seismic criteria. It took another four months before we could get a meeting to, together to discuss a re resolution to this issue. And once received, we once again revised phase one through phase three documents and new, uh, new permits were issued in February of 2021. The revised phase four permit package was resubmitted on February 24th, 2021, almost a year and a half after the original package was submitted. The fire marshal did allow us to avoid what they call uh, bend time by committing to prioritize the final permit processing in their workload. We received 21 pages of comments on the phase four package on April 30th, and our team quickly responded to the comments by May 25th, an attempt was made to conduct a virtual meeting with the plan checker. However, due to the lack of availability by a supervisor in the fire marshal's office, we were unable to make that happen. So clarifications were all made via email. On June 18th, we agreed to defer the fire sprinkler and fire alarm scopes of work to expedite approval of the architectural plans, which is our scheduled critical path. And throughout the month of June, Jack was in constant communication with the supervising deputy at the state fire marshal's office. And based on her comments, we fully expected to have resolution to the final issues with a face-to-face -face meeting to finalize. And this didn't happen. And then earlier this week, we received another 12 pages of comments from the fire marshal's office and another request to meet face-to-face -to, -face to sort out the rem remaining issues is pending. On a side note, the team engaged InterWest, which is a recognized independent plan firm to look at the phase four submittal and provide their expert opinion of the plan so that we could be proactively thinking about potential comments from the fire marshal's office. We received several rounds of comments from them in which we corrected and they gave their acceptance on June 29th, 
2021 if they were the jurisdiction in charge. An important note is that there was a really bad fire season during 2020, worth it, one of the worst that California has ever seen, which caused resource constraints to the fire marshal's office as staff were, report, were deployed for support, which I'm sure required a reshuffle of resources. However, those delays have caused an issue on our project. Until we have the final per permit in hand, we will not know the extent of the cost implications based on these delays. We're hoping to have something to the board by September. However, it could be late as the November timeframe. And I have Michelle Azevedo and Dave Higgins with Ridge Capital on the line, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have about this update. Lisa, I don't see any, uh, any hands. And I know that uh, Bill and uh, Sharon are well-versed in some of these delays and, and uh, would bring anything else to our attention that they thought was warranted. So uh, I think we'll just simply move forward. Thank you very much. Bill, yeah, go right ahead, Bill. Yeah, I, I would just like to uh, uh, point out that uh, Dave and, and uh, uh, Michelle, who've been really on the tip of the spear here uh, dealing with the, and Dave especially dealing with the uh, fire marshal's office, um, have really shown the patience of Job in, in these efforts. And, um, and frankly, you know, uh, I, I just began to review this project, I think in the past year when Harry, you asked me to be part of the team of two and I must say that, uh, you know, at the outset, I was very concerned about the fire marshal's uh, dilatory uh, attention uh, uh, in response to these issues. And, uh, and I was, you know, uh, uh, it was pointed out to me that uh, historically, you know, within the uh, contracting community uh, to put any pressure on the fire marshal to move with any speed can oftentimes result in retribution, uh, which is a rather disturbing uh, concept. Um, and I acknowledge that the fire marshal uh, has, you know, fire safety is obviously a, a primary concern, especially during these times uh, of global climate change and acknowledge the fact that, that the fire marshal's number one priority is probably dealing with that. Not probably, it is dealing with that. But on the other hand, the fire marshal's office had, uh, from my, what I'm told, uh, been uh, allotted certain funds to increase this review process because it impacts a lot of state buildings. There are a lot of state buildings that are facing the same problem of, uh, of delays in the fire marshal's approval of plans. And so, you know, I would just like to, you know, uh, suggest that that you know whatever we do we try to get a meeting where we can get everybody in one room where we can sort this out because the cost of this is running up i mean it can be you know i think the last report was the delays were in the range of about four million dollars and there are going to be further delays now and so you know we've we have a contingency in the contract but we're, we're going to be above that contingency. So we're going to have an overrun here, uh, potentially. I mean, there may be ways that we can deal with it, but those ways would uh, result in us scaling back the nature of the project, doing away with the, 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 uh, uh, the on-site childcare facility, uh, you know, reducing the capacity of, of uh, the cafeteria in, in, the, in the building. So, I mean, all of these things... Um, are I think of, of, of deep significance. So whatever help uh, we can get from the state uh, to you know lean on the fire marshal to exercise a little bit more vigor and 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 even being able to sit down at a meeting before Jack left. By the way, he would call and he didn't get returns of call. And so you know, quite frankly, I, I you know I blew a gasket at our last meeting with the with the staff, I mean, this is just simply wrong. Uh, you know, the, the state can't uh, permit this kind of thing to happen, even though I acknowledge that fire safety and, and these times, that's the number one priority, but you, you were also increasing the cost to every state agency that's building is in uh, 
plan review for months and months and months. So anyway, I just wanted to add that. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate your and Sharon's continued oversight on behalf of the board. Okay, back to you, Cassandra. Thank you. That, those were the only things I wanted to highlight in the report. And I appreciate uh, Bill's comments and we are absolutely continuing our um, engagement efforts with the fire marshal and we will continue to um, offer ourselves up for meetings and we'll be re as responsive as we need to absolutely get this um, to the level that they're um, willing to approve it. So with that, I think we're Thanks. that wraps up the CEO report. Thank you very much, Cassandra. Um, brings us to item seven, which is the consent agenda, 7A through 7F. Uh, I've, I've got Mr. Barto, our general counsel, who wants to comment on uh, one of the items. Which item is that, Brian? You're on mute. Uh, 7F, the, uh, the review of delegations. Okay, before we get to you, Brian, are there any board members that wanna pull any of the items on consent? Okay, seeing none, uh, Brian, I'll turn it over to you to comment on. Yes, Ms. Bell. Um, I do have one item to read for 7A, a um, decision by the board, but I'll defer to you. Would no, you like right to do that first? Go ahead, Ms. Okay. Bell, do that for 7A. Thank you. For okay, great. Um, so this is from the um, Arms or Audits, Arm Committee, Audit and Risk Management Committee. By the direction of the Audits and Risk Management Committee, the motion is to approve the 2021 calendar year internal audit plan with amendments as provided on page four of item four of the committee materials. Thank you, Ms. Bell. And I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Bartow. Brian. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to take a minute because I've been asked this question by uh, board members and by staff on the CEO delegation. Uh, if you've had a chance to review it, it, nowhere does it mention the CEO by name. Uh, it's just addressed to the CEO, powers of the CEO, in which case the transition to our new CEO, uh, Cassandra, is um, seamless as far as the delegation. There's nothing else that the board needs to do. Uh, we have brought back the delegation several times over the last few years um, for adjustment, for uh, amendment or inclusion, where we've seen some some item or issue where we feel like the CEO's uh, delegation needs to be clarified or expanded. Uh, there are no recommendations at this point to change that delegation. Uh, we think it's functioning well and it will under the new CEO. I do, um, but I do see that it was last um, uh, executed by uh, Dana in 2016. So I would ask, um, when we are physically uh, present that we would get the chair, current chair of the board to uh, sign the delegation, uh, renew the delegation and sign it. Has to be notarized, which is why I'd like to wait until we're all physically present, we can have a notary. Uh, but I'm not recommending any changes nor a staff. And then as to the board delegations, there are various delegations of the committees that are noted. There have been no changes over the last several years. I would just point out that um, based upon um, Mr. Brazon's comments this morning and as well as Amy McDuffie's that we may see some suggested changes in those coming on the board governance committee. Uh, but we will to be determined in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Seeing no other hands or comments uh, without objection, the consent agenda is approved. Item eight or items referred for, by the committee. I don't recall any items referred. Are there any items referred that I missed? Um, no, I have one item um, for um, information requests and that's it. Which one was that Ms. Bell? Oh, so for item five, um, I did have a specific request by Mr. Prezant for any interim reports on um, pensions and the pension solution project in anticipation of the September board meeting. And that was the only specific request there. There was um, comments by board members for staff regarding what they'd like to see discussed in the September board meeting. Right, and I think uh, 
I've captured that in the summary of that item. So thank you for that. Um, item nine are, is the new business items. I don't believe we have any new business items. 10 is the draft agenda for September. Uh, I see our Cassandra's on. Cassandra, do you wanna comment on any of those items that we'll be addressing in September? Just uh, three things I already mentioned that we are adding two items that were missed from the work plan and that's the proposed operating budget concepts and the enterprise risk management report. So those will be added. The only other thing that I would um, pose to, the, uh, to you as the uh, chair, Mr. Keeley is, um, postponing the pension solution system functionality of uh, maybe later in the year in January to allow us and staff to work and do all the due diligence they, they need to do while they're um, going through the schedule shift and renegotiating any um, changes that might be made in the uh, information that we're going to be uh, preparing and compiling for you to make any decisions. So I would just offer that up if you would like to move it maybe to January where there might be more time or we can we can still do it, but I will leave that up to you. Yeah, why don't, why don't we uh, uh, determine that to be determined? We'll just, uh, if we need to pull it, we will. We, we uh, I think we should follow your suggestion. It's probably September is not the proper time. Um, so thanks. Anything okay. else, Cassandra? Nothing else. Okay, great. Thank you. Brings us to public comments. I believe we have a member of the public. Ger, do we have a member of the public uh, that would like to address us? Yes, we have two members of the public in queue. Three minutes each, please. Our first caller is Linda. Linda, go ahead. Oh, just excuse me. I'm very nervous about this. Um, first of all, I want to, um, due to the experiences, my own personal with boards and the protocol, I understand not to expect questions or responses from um, any uh, on the board, and I'm grateful for this opportunity. Also, I must inform you that back, that everything I present is backed by documented evidence that Brian, uh, legal counsel or Brian Barto, as well as Terry Robinson, are fully aware that my findings back those claims up. And I also am aware that it's not slander or libel if it's true. So I'm going to begin. I would like to apologize for the tardiness of this notification, but due to the toxic acts of obstruction that degraded my mental state, I discovered this opportunity several weeks ago. Uh, due to the reality of one not knowing what they don't know, the actions I am taking will reveal this board is being held blameless in this. And unlike, which I was very alarmed, the potential liability based on what that information the union leader gave is facing being the deep pockets of it's you know if it's true a part of a renegade corporate pyramid scheme. So what I am notifying you is that I am preparing a white collar criminal complaint with, uh, with the state attorneys general. This complaint charges Brian Barto, Terry Robertson, and several others with the conspiracy and the enactment of fraud. Um, of a settlement, the enactment of a fraud of a settlement agreement issued at a hoax of a hearing. All those named are fully aware that the evidence I have will back the charges of civil fraud. I have no intention of suing Calsters as a, uh, of suing Calsters. A, as a client, all my due process rights were bullied out of existence by ombudsman, I can't even say the word now, Tom Bartlett, and discovered his title was a PC for corporate thug. However, I am re uh, requesting- Thirty seconds remaining. This or, excuse me? 30 seconds Hello? Remaining. However, I am requesting this board to grant me a special hearing uh, to go over the, my complaint and my evidence before I turn it in. But if you choose to listen to the response of outrage and denial and attacks on my sanity provided by Mr. Bott and his people and ignore my request, 
Again, I'm not talking about food, and you can accept the consequences of that choice. I also want to notify you that Mr. Aaron was notified of this in spring 2020 and June 2021. I assumed he retired last time. Hello? Next speaker, please. Thank you for your comment. Hello. That actually concludes uh, public comment for this item. Okay, thank you. I, I do rec I want to recognize Controller Yee, you have your hand up. I'm sorry, I missed you earlier. No, that's okay, uh, Harry. Um, <clears throat> just on the uh, information request, uh, and you did mention in your comments about uh, just some of the historical documents rele uh, relevant to the Pension Solutions Project. Um, and I wanted to see if we could um, maybe just utilize the um, great tool that we have of diligent to maybe post just some of those items up so that we're not bombarded with paper. <laughs> so. It's a terrific suggestion. And um, just get, if we could have staff come on to uh, acknowledge the request that they heard it, they recognize what it is and that uh, yeah. in the appropriate time, uh, we would get notified with an email that those materials and that document has been posted to Diligent for our review. Great, thank you. Okay, I will do that, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bell. And thank you, uh, Controller Yee. Okay, uh, lunchtime. Uh, we're, we're gonna break till uh, 1.30. We were scheduled to come back at 1.30. It's an abbreviated lunch, but it still gives us an hour and 15 minutes it's, if that's okay with everyone. Okay, good. We'll see everyone at, uh, and we get to log in to closed session at 1.30. We'll see everyone then. Take care. Good afternoon, everyone. The CalSTRS board met in closed session the af this afternoon and the CalSTRS board unanimously approved the CIO, that's the chief, as chief investment officer's base salary for the 21-22 uh, fiscal year. CalSTRS board also unanimously adopted the CEO performance criteria as presented by Amy McDuffie from Mosaic our board governance consultant. That concludes our action for the day. Thank you and have a good afternoon.